So this is the 2022 release with Ranger for Seasonal Distress Halloween. And I say seasonal because if you are not familiar with this particular release with Ranger, this is a seasonal release, which means when it's gone, it is gone for good, right? This isn't something that's part of the, uh, the everyday distress line. The colors are very unique to the season. And when these items, including the cardstock and the paste, when they sell out, they are gone. So uh, I'll talk about the colors and I'll give you a little bit more kind of background or a little bit more info uh, on these products and also about last year's release because last year, 2021, was the first time we ever did a seasonal collection. It was very cool. I know many of you uh, celebrated last season by getting these products and it was important to note that these products that we're doing, although they are seasonal and they have seasonal names and, and great kind of uh, colors to them, they can be used uh, year round because by the end of uh, the season last year, see we had a full rainbow of the seasonal colors last year and the plan will be exactly the same this year, but with different colors. So what I did when we were talking about this is uh, I was very excited that Ranger wanted to do this again. So thank you to everyone at Ranger and thank you to all of you guys for supporting it because it was enough that they said, okay, yeah, it did well, you know, we'll bring it back because you know, nobody wants to sit on uh, leftover Halloween product or, or Christmas product for that matter. So what this seasonal release this year consists of uh, are two sets of Distress Mica Stain, and I'll talk about the Mica Stain and what it is. Uh, these are only available in sets. The colors are not sold open stock. They just come in the three packs. And then they also have the coordinating uh, colors of Distress Crayons. Now, although they just say Distress Crayons, there's an entire video from last year that these are actually Mica Crayons or pearlescent crayons. Some people call them pearlescent. Uh, I refer to them as Mica because they have uh, the same kind of Mica that would be in the sprays. Uh, last year, of course, uh, for those that followed, these were very delayed. They were months behind the release of the spray. So I'm really happy that uh, we're able to kind of launch it all together. But I will tell you this, they are still delayed, just not as bad as last year. Delayed enough where uh, some of the crayons have shown up in some stores. Uh, for the majority of stores, these crayons will be uh, showing up in more stores worldwide, I would say, end of August into early September. So delayed a couple weeks, but not too bad. The sprays, they have already been uh, shipping worldwide. They've, they're in stores. And then we get over to these accessories. One of my favorites, I can't wait to share more techniques with it. This is a two-tone wood grain cardstock. If you're familiar with the Distress wood grain cardstock that is white, that is inkable, this is already a pre-colored wood grain. It's the same great texture, but it is a black wood grain with this cool kind of gray uh, debossed into it amazing and where do you see uh, the Christmas one uh, and then we have this jar of grit paste crypt last year if you remember we did those little uh, jars of paste we also did little jars of sparkle and well you guys have spoken which is essentially like yeah that stuff was fun but we needed way more of this uh, crypt paste so that's why we just decided to go with the the standard jar that we have now of our textures we did this in in grit paste crypt you'll see what makes this so magical but again seasonal. So that is, that is the release. I would say that this, this, and this, right? The stuff that uh, is Rangers made in-house, these are all available worldwide. Crayons and wood grain, those are the things that are a little delayed. But again, it's in some stores, but you will see it showing up uh, in, in all of the stores that have ordered it near the end of this month into early September. I think actually this wood grain is probably going to be shipping next week. So this is going to be shipping even before this. Look, everyone is doing the best. And I mentioned this when I did the Instagram at the beginning. I did an Instagram live at the beginning of the season uh, in August and just talked about like, look, every brand is doing their best to get Halloween product out. And I'm just thankful that they did it. So give everybody uh, a little bit more grace and patience from the manufacturers to the distributors to the retailers. Like everyone is doing all we can to get product. I'm just happy that we have it. All right. So let's get into the colors of the stuff. We're going to talk about these guys first, the Distress Mica Stain, because although they look very similar to last year's palette, they are in fact different uh, tonal values are different colors. One thing we also did different, so I'll, I'm actually I'm gonna set up a little space a little bit different. <laughs> I'm gonna bring in uh, last year's sets, right? With this year's sets. So you'll notice a distinct difference, which is uh, this year's packaging actually has the color striped behind it on the card. And I think that makes a, a big difference because so cool. although, th thanks, like it's a good idea. Although all of mine look, you know, perfectly you know, set up and twisted. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I got to show you the smoke and mirrors. Look at the back of my packaging. I slice it open 
I cut it and I go in the back and kind of move all of these bottles so they all face forward because if you've seen them on, on the shelf or maybe when you order them, these bottles just love to spin. No matter, you know, Ranger tries to put little bumps or little grooves to keep them, but they spin. And it, it, it's frustrating when you're going to buy because you don't know what colors are there. Uh, so I'm like, well, if we put it on the back, at least you, you may not be able to read the name uh, on there, but you're going to see it. But we also put the color names on the back this time. Something we didn't do last year, so we'll kind of learn that. But you'll see that uh, the last year's sets and this year's sets, we still have the, the orange, the yellow, the gray, the green, the blue, kind of the, the mucky color, okay? But these really work well together. So let me talk about the strategy before we get into the colors, all right? It's kind of like I feel like I'm doing some type of magic trick over here. Okay, these colors, these two sets, set one and two we're going to refer to for Halloween. These were launched last year. They sold out. Uh, I did mention to you guys that if you liked them, get more than one set because, you know, there was no guarantee that they're coming back uh, this year. In fact, I even hinted last year in the lives that most likely I would be doing new colors if Ranger let me do another Halloween release, which is exactly what I did. Because I wanted to build up the palette. You didn't want to go totally different. I still want to have a full, you know, rainbow of colors, but I wanted to have different tones, different uh, values. But I also know that by switching out colors, it does put certain makers like myself into a little bit of a panic buy, right? Where it's like, oh my gosh, well, I love flickering candles. So if it's never going to be made again, you know, I don't ever want to use it. I, I didn't want that either. So I did talk to Ranger this year when we were doing these new colors. And here's what they agreed to so far. If this year's seasonal does well, which I hope it does, I hope it does as well as, as last year, that they would agree that next year we would go back to this palette. And then the next year we would go back to this palette. So we would be able to alternate these colors. So you would know as a maker that every other year, those particular tones would come back, right? Because, you know, once, once we have these colors, we're essentially going to have, you know, 24 seasonal colors in a palette. Uh, and so having these come back every other year, I think as a maker, it's just going to be good because you'll be able to say, like I saw a comment, like I love fortune teller. I agree that this is an amazing color, but I think it's important to also know as a maker that if you like it, use it, but just know that if you're going to use it every year that you want to have kind of a, a two year stash on hand, right? Depending on which colors you use and, and how often you use it. So that's just good to know. Uh, and I appreciate Ranger doing that, that it would be good that, you know, these will come back next year. These will come back the next year, but we're not going to release like all of them at the same time. We'll always be uh, two sets and we'll alternate it. And that's it. You get what you get and you don't throw a fit. All right. Yeah, and don't forget so that those last there we go. Sets are mine. Yes, I know. I know. Mario's like, I'm keeping it. Well, I'm glad you have a stash. Yeah, because, yeah, because if, if it was me, I would have used it up. Right. I would. Uh, and the same thing goes for the crayons, right? I'll talk about uh, the crayons as well. Same thing, right? We had last year's colors, uh, this year's colors. I have seen these out uh, still in stores, these crayons. So you can, I think you might even be able to pick these up at a lot of retailers, last year's colors of Halloween and Christmas. But you'll see they're such a great, just Halloween alone is such a great uh, set for fall, especially if you love these colors. Again, alternating. We're going to do the same thing with Christmas. Again, as long as as long as things do well, they'll bring them back every other year until they won't. And I think that that was a fair a fair compromise on their half, right? So let's go into the colors themselves. I've already put the colors into uh, general population for my swatches, meaning uh, I'll talk about the new colors, but I'll also show you how they compared to last year's colors. There is last year's Christmas in here. I don't have this year's Christmas in here yet because, well, that's not happening until October. All right. So let's get into, we'll do uh, this first set. So this first set is Harvest Moon, Burning Ember, and Iron Gate. Okay. That's going to be kind of the, I call it the candy corn pack because I like it. But if you're not familiar with Distress Mica Stain, what it is, it is a sprayable dye, a colorant like Distress Spray Stain that has a mica pearl in it, okay? But that mica pearl is, is pretty much fused to the ink when you mix it up. So at the bottom of the bottles, you'll see if the bottles are upright, that mica is going to settle at the bottom, okay? Uh, but when you shake it up and you go to use it and you spray it onto a surface, that ink and mica go onto the surface and become one, which is really incredible. This is the color comparison between last year's jack-o'-lantern, right? And this year's burning ember. Now these colors are really made up of current distress colors, but I work with the guys in the lab at Ranger, the chemists, and we kind of create custom blends, if you will, right? So this is a little bit of crackling campfire 
and rusty hinge, right? So we got that, that really nice deep orange with a little bit of red undertones, but just very cool. Also very unique is that each of these have their own color of pearl. That's another thing that makes mica stain different is that the color of pearl, so you can see even between these two, it's not the same orange pearl. It's a pearl that is tinted to the actual color. And what I've also learned from having these for more than a year is that the mica actually starts to take on some color, which is really cool. Like the longer I've had them, some of the colors actually shift a little bit, which I find very fascinating uh, that the mica kind of has different tone properties, which very, very cool. All right, so those are, those are the comparisons of the orange. Now we get into yellow. And I know that last year people loved flickering candle. I know that Paula was like, please tell me that's never going away. I'm like, well, it, it was last year. This is, this is flickering candle last year, kind of like, uh, I'm gonna say a fossilized amber kind of look. This, Harvest Moon, this has a little bit more squeezed lemonade meets mustard seed. But I love it because it is a brighter yellow. You can certainly mix these. But also when you take a look at the pearl, right? This had that really warm yellow. This one kind of has, that's why I called it Harvest Moon, kind of that moon glow, right? Almost a very, a very pale, almost lemony color. It's not white because if it was white, it would look kind of snowy on here. It isn't. It's just, it's that light of a yellow, like a, like a chiffon. And I love it. I love how these yellows, because you know me, I'm not a, not a huge fan of a hundred different yellows, right? But if they're distinctly different enough, then we need more than one yellow tone. So I like having those yellows. Then we get into the gray. And that was an interesting one because I did struggle with, with ultimately what I wanted, but I was very happy that we just continued to push through and get exactly what I wanted, okay? So um, last year when we did Empty Tomb, right? It was, a, it was a black base. I went with black soot and then we added kind of this gunmetal pearl. And I wanted something a little bit smokier, kind of like hickory smoke and a little bit of pumice stone. So this is the new Iron Gate, right? So when you look at it initially, you know, sometimes you're like, oh, they're exactly the same. But when you really see them on a substrate, they are not. This pearl is just a little bit lighter gray. Again, I didn't want to go white, but you can see the color values. This is definitely more black, the tomb. Iron Gate is a definitely, definitely more silver kind of metallic look. And they all have that ink color underneath, okay? And I'm gonna get way more into uh, how these differ from the other micas and all of that. And then we're gonna get into the next set. So this is Fortune Teller, Wicked Elixir, and Decayed. And if anyone knows me, you would probably know by this name that it would be my favorite, okay? But we'll, we'll talk about Fortune Teller. So Fortune Teller is gonna take us kind of to the purple range, right? So last year, Right, we had Hocus Pocus, that's gonna be this really deep, beautiful violet color. And then look at Fortune Teller. Woo -hoo. This is kind of a blend of seedless preserves and a little bit of uh, Victorian velvet. And I love this uh, kind of this combo. You can see it still has some deep, deep tones to it, but the pearl in it, very, very different from uh, last year's Hocus Pocus. So see, it's good. For those of you that have both sets, if this is year two, I hope that you are sitting there, you know, like the same way I was when I saw these colors. I was like, yay, new colors. But if not, if this is your first year, see, fear not. It's like you just, you can start here and then next year you'll build up the palette and you'll be just as this over somebody else that's starting next year. There's always, there's always a win there, right? But these purples, very, very nice. I like how they complement each other. And then we get into Wicked Elixir. Definitely very wicked. I love greens and you'll see that there's gonna be more greens uh, coming out uh, even at Christmas right? Because last year we ended up with, with these, with Holly Branch and Bubbling Cauldron and Tree Lot. But take a look at this one, right? You can tell already Wicked Elixir, this is a little bit of Twisted Citron uh, meets Shabby Shutters. So it has a, a little bit of a deeper value than just straight on Twisted Citron, which is a very bright limey color. But I love the pearls. Again, take a look at how the pearls are different in all of those greens, right? So important, but I like that that luminous green. Of course, you can mix these and you'll see in the demo, you can mix not only the mica stain, but you can mix them with your ink pads, your spray stain, your oxide. So you can still kind of create your custom colors, right? So let's say you didn't get bubbling cauldron. You're like, oh, okay. Could I take Wicked Elixir and, and maybe add peeled paint stain to kind of tone it? Yes, you can. Obviously the pearl color is not gonna change, right? And that's, that's why you wanna build up this kind of palette, but you can still have fun with these colors, but pretty, Pretty amazing, right? 
And then we get into the wild card, Decayed. Now, again, for those that have seen previous lives, it, when we talk about um, frayed burlap, okay, as a color, frayed burlap is one of, one of my favorite browns in distress. It's, it's this, I don't know what it, it doesn't know what it is. It's sometimes greenish, sometimes brownish, but frayed burlap is really beautiful. And when we did the oxide spray of frayed burlap, you notice that like these weird green values came up out of that color for no reason. We had no idea like why it was happening, but it was magical and it was happening. So when I did Decayed, Decayed is actually a combination of, I gotta see if I can get my bottle out of this tin. There we go. I'll just, I'll take it out of here. I'm gonna just take it out of the tin and set it up so I can, cause I have one that's already open. Oh, there we go. It'll show you. Okay. It'll show you right here. Um, Decayed is actually a combo of frayed burlap and old paper. Okay, that was kind of my mix. Now compared to last year's Crooked Broomstick, which was definitely more brown, a little bit more gathered twigs, right? You can see the difference. But what's interesting about this is sometimes Decayed is going to look more on the greenish side and sometimes it's gonna look more on the gold side. See, depending on like how the light hits it or even the pearl, like can you see over here, it looks a little bit green right now. But then when you tip it, it looks a little bit more gold. It's a weird color. It's very chameleon. And I like that. I, li I love that about the, the unpredictability of, of working with this. And, you know, I'll, I'll talk about swatches because I like to still work on distressed watercolor cardstock. It, it is the most um, kind of absorbent for these colors. And I like that it, it maintains their color integrity. So most of my ink swatches are always done on distressed watercolor. Uh, this is the textured side. For these, I work on the smooth side because... Uh, it's going to give you that smooth finish. I, I, when I'm making backgrounds, you'll see I work on this side for backgrounds because I love the pits. But to show you the color, in order to get that real consistent sheen, we want this to be smooth. So that's why I work on the smooth side of the watercolor cardstock. So here's, here's Decay. Let me just show you real quick because I'll flip it over. Do you see the pearl? See how the pearl, like sometimes it looks blue and then sometimes it'll look gold. You see that? It's the same pearl. Isn't that wild? Very weird that Magic. you'll look at this. You're like, oh, it's a blue pearl. Oh, it's a gold pearl. You don't know what it is. I don't know what it is, but it's one of those magic -y things. And that's why I called it decayed because, you know, sometimes it just looks like eroded, uh, decayed things. But sometimes it even looks like like worn or a beautiful uh, tarnished metal. It's a good, good color. So those are the mica stains. Now, of course, mica stains can work on a variety of substrates, right? From white cardstock to black cardstock, even craft. So I always do a swatch of craft because this is the Distress Craft Heavy Stock. I love this 130 pound because I love to really showcase the intensity of the color. Sometimes when you see a sprayable ink, you just think, oh, okay. But because it has that pearl, it really does give you that flexibility of using these colors on other substrates, right? Not just white. So if you have darker color cardstock, it doesn't have to be brown or black. It could be blues, reds, whatever. It is nice to know that the ink, the stain, is still going to show up on those colors. Even when we get to this yellow, right? That harvest moon. That harvest moon is still reading a really bright yellow on brown paper. How crazy is that? That's what I really like about uh, doing swatches on this. When you go to black, and if, you, if you're unfamiliar with that, I encourage you to go watch last year's uh, release. If you just go to timholtz.com and type in 2021 Distress Halloween and you'll see it. Uh, I did a black swatch just to show people that if you use these on black, you actually lose all the ink color and you only get the pearl. So if you were to spray, say, you know, Wicked Elixir on black cardstock, all you would get is this green pearl because these colors are translucent. So those inks would vanish. Also, just a cool thing, and I have some black cardstock. We're going to play around with it. I didn't demo it much last year and, you know, I wanted to this year. I did go back and watch what I did last year because I wanted to do something different. So... <laughs> there we go. Um, but yeah, you can see all, all these colors. I mean, really? Take a look at that. Take a look at Fortune Teller. Oh my. Oh my, my. And these are really good. We're going to talk about stamping. You can use it with a gel plate. There's so many things that you can use these on. Look at Decayed. I mean, can you stop it right now? See? Green. Gold. Decayed. You don't know. You don't know what's going on. It is magic. It is. See? Oh, look down here. See now? It look, oh, looks like, looks like there's a face. See, it's a decayed ghost with even little eyeballs. He's kind of silly. Let's see, my imagination runs wild. But down here, gold. Up here, kind of greenish. Ooh, hocus pocus. Odd. That's already a color name. Sorry, it's taken. Purple claimed it last year. 
<laughs> I know. All right, so those are the swatches for the Mica Stain. Beautiful, beautiful colors for this year. Again, thanks, Ranger, for having those. All right, let me set those. We're going to get into the crayons, we're going to get into the paste, and then we're going to get into just demo fun. All right, the crayons. So here's the thing to know about these, and I, I talked in depth. There is an entire uh, video from last year on these particular crayons where I show the Halloween and the Christmas and talk you through them. Uh, these are a mica crayon, which means they're still a water reactive pigment, but they have a, a mica in them, right? Different uh, kind of, I would say, mm, different consistency, and that's not the right word. I'll use that word anyway. It's a different consistency or um, percentage, I'll just say that. A different percentage of pearl in these than the sprays because what I wanted is I really wanted a subtle shimmer. So if you were going to watercolor with these, you would, you see that? You would get that subtle shimmer in these crayons. Now these just say Distress Crayon like all of them. So on the barrel, even on the package, it doesn't say like Mica Crayon. So for me personally, I keep these separate from my regular crayons, right? Just because I want to know if I'm using something shimmery, but I absolutely love these. And I'm so glad, I think this was one of the things that I got like 12 packs of because you do go through crayons pretty, pretty quick. But you can also tell by, by the caps, the caps do have a little bit more of a, of a pearlescent look to them than the standard cap. So if they do get mixed up, it is easy to tell from uh, the cap, but that's just my preference. I like to keep them separate because I use them a, a little bit different. Uh, and if you've seen uh, the make that uh, Paula did for Sizzix for the Halloween release, she used them over that, that Acorn 3D folder. They're just beautiful because you can go over the top, you can smudge them out, and it's almost like just doing kind of a, a pearlescent rub over the top, but it is a crayon. So you can color direct. This is watercolor cardstock, textured side. This is just watercolored out so you can see that the water reactive pigment works like a watercolor, creates that outline barrier like a watercolor. They're amazing on craft. You could also watercolor these, but it's really cool that you can just color over the top of something and get that beautiful shimmer. They work great over black. So if you're doing that skull folder, anything like that, it's just nice that you can even go over with a color. You can water this down and wash it and it's going to give you that washed effect on black, okay? These I just didn't bother to, to water them out just so you can see the true color, okay? So let's talk about how do they compare from last year? Because I kind of feel like if I don't, someone's gonna say, oh, he didn't show us because they're exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, I'm totally like that. So here's the difference, here, here, yeah. Here's the difference between last year's crayon and this year. So again, you can see that brighter yellow that we have in Harvest Moon from Flickering Candle, that really deep, uh, reddish orange in Burning Ember from Jack O' Lantern, that more silvery, right, undertone in Iron Gate, then we had that black area in Empty Tune. That's what I said. The pearl, they look very similar, but the color, they're very different, right? This is more hickory smoke, this is more black soot, all right? And the same thing goes for really all the substrates. You'll see those, those differences, right? It just depends on how you look at it. See, like the pearl, you're like, oh, those are pretty similar. Oh, no, okay, different. But I, I do, I like, I like having color comparisons of things, right? Same thing even on the black, All right? It's much darker, much grayer. Good, huh? All right, we'll get into these. So much fun when, when we're working with these because I think sometimes people underestimate the crayon. They, they read that word and they're like, oh, crayons, it's just like coloring in a book. No, this is really just an amazing uh, watercolor medium as well, especially because we're gonna get that little bit of pearl. Okay, so we already know here uh, that when we're talking about these colors, right? I'll just bring both of them up at the same time. Okay, compared Hocus Pocus and Fortune Teller, we can see just that beautiful uh, reddish purple, right? Wicked Elixir compared to Bubbling Cauldron, totally different kind of green. And then of course, Crooked Broomstick, and then, well, there's Decayed, right? Take a look at that. See what I mean by that gold? Where you look at it, you're like, oh, it's kind of brownish muck. Ooh, fool's gold. I think that's just a great, it, it's a great surprise. I think in that same thing, coloring those out, you're just going to get those different values. You can really pick up the gold here on decayed. It almost looks, I mean, it almost looks non-existent on craft, doesn't it? Cause it is that kind of burlapy uh, old paper color compared to how dark crooked broomstick is. You kind of don't notice that when you see the pearl of it, but when you see the, the color in the crayon, wow. 
All right, and then we have, where is my other sample? Oh, I don't know. Oh, here it is. It's over here. I'm like, did I miss one? No, look at that. See, I do like the, the bright, the bright vividness of that Wicked Elixir. It's just really good. And just how the, the purples glow. Fun. And again, when you're doing swatches, you don't have to do all of this, right? You can just do a line. You know, this one was, I just took a, a little strip of paper and just did a line in watercolor. So you don't have to make a giant thing. I do this obviously for the video, but this is kind of uh, my swatch card, right? Because it's very easy for me then to see that shine that pearlescent shine in the colors, and I like how they watercolor out. That's also important, especially if you like to watercolor, so you can see how light you can pull out some of those colors to be. And I just use a water brush, get a lot of water in there to dissolve that, and just pull that out and let it dry and see what you get, right? So that's really the swatch that I work with in a normal, a normal world for crayons. That's why I don't have these like on a ring, right? These are my swatches that I just hang here. This is, this is for show, this is show and tell, okay? Then we'll get into this stuff. If you don't know about the Grip Paste Crypt, right? I think last year Zoe was calling it Crypt Paste because she was just like, it has its own name. It's gonna be its own thing. And I, I agree. So what this is, this is, it starts out as a base of Grip Paste. If you're, if you're not familiar with Grip Paste, Grip Paste is actually a product in, in the line, in the Distress line. We have Grip Paste, okay? That's what it's called. It's in a jar like this but you will see that it will either be opaque or translucent, right? So this is what normal grit paste is, everyday grit paste. This is stuff that's available year round. So the opaque one is, is white. It's great for snow, it's great for texture. You can paint on it. It just dries with a grit, okay? You can put it on with a palette knife. You can spread it out with your finger. Translucent, same thing, also has a grit to it, but it is translucent. A lot of people use this for rust and all sorts of cool uh, different techniques. This one is gesso based. So it's white and completely opaque, meaning if you paint this on something, you will not see anything that's underneath. This one, translucent. Now, anytime something is translucent, especially with particles, the thinner it is, the more translucent it is. The thicker it is, the more kind of frosty it gets. But still, you would be able to see through, you can see that brown through the, the transparent. Now, this one, we kind of took the transparent quality of this, tinted it, and then the the chemist added these little flecks of black, okay? Because I wanted this paste to really look like stone or granite or crypt, right? Something that you could alter all sorts of things. This is great not only for Halloween, but this is great in the springtime if you wanna do cobblestone, if you work on say uh, the Sizzix Village on the house and you wanna give it like a, a nice stone finish, this stuff is magic because you don't have to worry about tinting this or coloring this. You're always going to get this great look. Now, because it is translucent, again, the thinner it is, you're gonna get more of that like kind of greenish grayish color. The thicker it is, you're gonna get that darker color. And this is really tinted to kind of coordinate with a lot of ideology stuff, right? So if you're familiar with the urns that we do for, uh, for ideology for Halloween, all this little chunkity nuggety bits, that's just crit paste, just dabbed on with my finger. And you could go in and color this, right? I've seen a lot of makers, Tammy B goes in and kind of turns this into moss, right? Color this with the crayons, but it gives a great texture to it. If you put it over something that's not a similar color, like this one, I only did half just to show you, these are the ideology tombstones. It, now it takes on that property of a bit more mossy kind of crusty look. And if you wanted to, you could have painted this tombstone, say with pumice stone or another color, and then it would coordinate similar to kind of these urns. But I like the fact that this color is very interesting because you can use it on something to, to give it more of that stone texture, or you can use it on something darker and that weird coloring to me mimics kind of a, a mossy grime, right? So it's fun. You can see why it's a favorite and you can see why, you know, that, that tiny little uh, single serving jar, it wasn't even a single serving. You can kind of get that. So. Oh, I just saw, Apollo just said you can apply it very thin for a beachy look. Absolutely, you could try that out because you're right. That does kind of look like sandy beach when you get that thin. And if you were going to do something thin, my advice to you, good. I see, I love the conversation, all right? If you wanted to thin this out, mix this with this, okay? Because the, trans, the translucent grit paste is the base of crypt, 
okay? So if you, if you put some of this in, you would actually make it a little bit more translucent. You would kind of dilute the colorant in there and disperse that a little bit more. So that's great to kind of think about if you're really always going for that thin look, but maybe you want a little bit more texture, just you know, scoop some with your palette knife on your mat, scoop some of that transparent, mix it together, and then spread it out, and you'll get a, a more uh, transparent look to it. So cool, yeah. I love this stuff. It is one of those things I know makers are like, oh, I need to stock up. Be careful, stock up, but you better use it because you know that's the other thing. You know, Ranger doesn't make everlasting gobstoppers, right? We're not Wonka here. So any craft product that you buy from inks to, to crayons to paste, it's not gonna last forever. It's not gonna last, you know, years and years. The sprays, that's gonna be fine, right? Because they're in there. The crayons are actually pretty good as well. If you're gonna do paste, well, you know, you're still gonna probably wanna do some press and seal and do whatever you can to keep it or keep it shrink wrap, that might help. Uh, but you definitely want to use your your art mediums, okay? Sorry, we're not walking. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm gonna hear about that. I don't know what I say when I say it. All right, so the cardstock. I'm gonna get into the cardstock when I talk about the technique a little bit more. I don't want to spend too much time just explaining it until I can really show you. But let's get into just talking about how we can use this stuff with with our Halloween makes and and for Halloween. I think it'd be really good. All right, let me get. Let me get my media mat out. There we go. A little surface to work on because I really need that. Okay, good deal. So I am working, I've got glass here on the media mat and then I have my non-stick craft mat. I do have a new one, I will tell you. This is new, um, not, not the glass. This is my same glass mat, but this one, you know, mine go for, I think I get maybe like six months and then they're just, they're horrible. I'll actually, <laughs> it's in the trash can. So I'll show you. And I know probably I should keep it for hot glue and we're gonna get all of those. And actually I think I'm gonna keep it for hot glue. This is what it looks like, right? Because I am I'm really aggressive with, with the mat, right? Meaning, you know, when I go in, plus I, I wear jewelry, I wear rings, you know, I wear bracelets. So whenever I'm cleaning, that's still going to kind of scratch through this. It, this still works, it just looks a little mucky and that's okay. So it, but you know, for camera, I want it to look nice for you guys. I'm, I'm actually, See, I'm glad I talked about it. I saved it because that is going to make a great glue mat. It doesn't matter that it doesn't look good. It's going to be perfect for, for sticky stuff. Okay. When it comes to working with uh, the mediums, I, uh, I would love to say, I, I know last year, like when I was watching the video, I remember talking about putting my sprays in this Distress Ink Pad tin where I removed the insert and I'm like, oh yeah, we should have this uh, by the end of the year. Uh, sadly, it's now a year later and I'm still talking that we don't have a tin. But there is a tin in development. It's, it's, it's been around for, it's been in development, I don't know, since 2019, but it, it is a tin that is going to hold uh, paints, sprays, and the glass distress reinkers. If and when it comes out, I'm, I'm hopeful it's going to make it, but sadly it, did, it didn't make it before this, but we remain hopeful. But for right now, until that storage tin uh, comes out, I have these just in uh, my distress pad tin. I popped out the insert. I kept the insert because, you know, when these go into where I want to put them, um, I'll be able to snap the insert back in. But again, for storage, there's a lot of things that, that you can consider. The upside to this, because there is an upside to storing them this way, when I work with sprays, especially sprays that have a type of, of pigment in them, I like to lay them on their sides when I go to use them. So let's just say you have all of your sprays on a shelf. My tip is that when you're going to work with them, take them out and lay them on your table or somewhere on their side because what's gonna happen is instead of all the pearl sitting in that ring like it normally does, see that? It sits down there. That's where the little end of the schnozzle is from your, your sprayer. It's like right in the, in the mud. By laying them on their side, it slowly makes that, that mica go up the side of this. And now when you go and shake it up, it, it mixes all this up much faster. Okay, so that's just my advice to you on that. Let me just, I'm just gonna take out the new colors of this because I don't think it's, I don't think it's right that I, I work with colors that last year they had their demo. I still use them. I mean, I use mine all year, but I will demo with these and I'll take some other colors for a regular general population. Um, they, they won't link if you have the lid on. No, they don't, they don't leak as long as you have the lids on. That's, that's why I'm suggesting storing them on their side like that, uh, if you have it. Just, you know, so if you're, let's say you wipe things down, just make sure that the lid is, is twisted on. So it's a spray, so that's really nice. And of course, you know, Ranger makes quality stuff, so there's a seal inside this cap. You know, there's a seal inside the sprayer. So that's, that's kind of a nice benefit of, 
of buying, you know, Ranger makes good stuff. They do. So on these sprays, again, sideways, you get that pearl there. You have some options of shaking, right? You can shake these like a bell when you go to use it. If you shake them like a bell, that kind of keeps things going uh, the way they need to go, okay? If you shake them up and down, okay, you're gonna get stuff leaking out of that top. If you just start shaking it like this, you could get this to start leaking out of that top sprayer, okay? But as long as you're working with these, it's really up to you. I think it has to do with altitude. I think it has to do with a lot of things. For me, I just kind of do this, or if I'm in a rush, which is pretty much 99% of the time when I'm making because I don't overthink the ink, um, I tend to have my, my cloth, my, my inky binky, and I just put it over the, the spray top and then I can just shake it regular. There's a mixing ball, right? You want that mixing ball to move. If you don't hear the mixing ball, keep shaking until you do, right? Sometimes you may want to give it a little tap because that ball might be stuck in the mud, but you need to have that mixing ball because that's gonna tell you that it's knocking all that pearl around. Because the, the problem is if you just give it a quick shake and you don't mix it up and you go to spray it and you suck up some of that mica into the spray, it will clog the sprayer. And that's really frustrating because then you have to take it off, soak it in hot water, try to spray the water through, and hope that the sprayer comes back, okay? It's not always the case because it's, you know, it's, it's a mechanism. And if you get little, little grit stuck where it shouldn't be, well, then you need a replacement sprayer. And Ranger sells a, a two-pack of replacement sprayers. A lot of times, if you just remember to shake it up, and I always look at the bottom before I spray it. If I don't see any pearl at the bottom, it's good to go because that's where the end of that, that little straw is. So that means it's going to be taking it in colorant. So it's totally up to you. Shake it like this, right? Or put a towel on it because if you don't and you shake it, yeah, you do risk these leaking everywhere out of the spray cap, right? Because you're shaking it. You're, you're actually pushing it past the seal up into the spray top and it's literally like coming out of the, the top of the sprayer because the sprayer, I'll just remove the top of this. We'll look at the mechanics, right? That's the top of the sprayer. It's just a bottle, a little nozzle right there. and it. When you press down, that's what dispenses it. But when you have so much force of shaking it, you're going to get it to like spit out the top. So a couple of things. I find it, you know, we get some pretty good leakers here because we're in high altitude. We're like a mile high elevation. So, you know, sometimes we, we have hot mess, right? But storage wise, and, and my advice to people as well, let's say you find that storing stuff on your side, on its side leaks. Okay, don't store it on its side, right? Same thing with ink pads. Uh, I get asked that a lot about distress pads, right? How do they need to be stored? Um, really, they don't need to be stored any special way. It's a suspended medium. But some people find that if they stand them up vertically, maybe where they live, uh, too much humidity, that they get like a little seepage out of the ink pad. So, so then just don't store it like that. You know, if you have the storage tin, you can store it upright so they lay flat. So it really just depends on, I think, climate and, and also humidity from what, I, from what I've learned through the years. Okay, so we've got these guys. Then we'll talk about mixing and matching, okay? Like I said, my crayons, they live in their own place. These are, these are all of my seasonal crayons, so they, they stay in their own crayon tin uh, because I just like to work with them that way. I like to work with those particular colors. I am gonna, <laughs> I get to put these in here now. That makes me happy. I don't like to keep my crayons in the set at all. I was that kid that just, Nope, I like, to, I like to dig around for colors. It's just, it's better that way. So I've got my, my crayons there. I'll have that off to the side. And we'll just kind of do some different backgrounds. I think it's gonna be really fun when, uh, when we start mixing colors. And I'll talk about different tools. But before I get into it, just give you just a quick rundown on these products, just to avoid any confusion, okay? So these products exist in the everyday line of distress, okay? So these are called mica sprays versus mica stain, okay? And mica sprays, they are also sold in a three pack, okay? You have brushed pewter, tarnished brass, antique bronze. These are the same colors as the distressed crayons that are also metallic. Now, when we say metallic or mica, it is the same mica that are, that are in these products that we do for seasonal, but the big difference between this product, mica, the mica spray and these crayons is these do not have a, a dye colorant to them, meaning these products are just the mica. Okay. So if you, if you wanted to add say silver, you could spray it over any color, blue, purple, whatever, but the pearl is going to be silver versus 
fortune teller, which the pearl is actually purple, okay? So my swatches, you can see, they're just spraying on white paper. It doesn't cover anything. It just gives you that pearl, right? So we could go over pattern paper. It could go over whatever, even like on black, beautiful, right? Or that, that pewter. But you can see that the mica, because it doesn't have a colorant to suspend to, right? Let me just bring up a silver here so you guys can see the difference. Again, I looked at last year and I'm like, I didn't cover this as, as much as I, as I want to because I want you to understand it. So see on this this mica spray, if it doesn't go on anything wet, it's just going to clump up. Those little particles are gonna to grab together and it's always gonna look kind of splotchy. Whereas the stain, because it can grab onto the colorant, it's going to give you more coverage. So if you wanted to create coverage, you can spray this onto something wet and you'll get a better coverage than if you just put on dry, okay? But these micas, I mean, <clears throat> they're amazing actually because you could go over uh, all of those different colors, but you're you're really limited to three colors of pearl, but they're all beautiful, right? Several, looks like a silver kind of pewter, a bronze and, and a gold. And same thing with the crayons, right? They have a great metallic property when you apply them uh, direct, but if you go to watercolor them, okay, there's not much color to this, but there is a beautiful shimmer. So you could put this you could scribble this down, put down another color of crayon, mix it together, and you could actually create a shimmery color, but the color of shimmer will always be the color of that metallic crayon. I hope that makes sense, okay? But that's why these are in the everyday line because they are really beautiful. You can spray these on ribbon, paper flowers, printed cardstock. Uh, you can just use them with all of your other inks. So if you, you know, do your little smushing technique with your ink pads, you can spray some mica stain down with your water, and then when you go through it, you're gonna get beautiful uh, blends of metallic but just know that those will be the metallic colors, unlike the mica stain where the pearl is actually the color of the ink, okay? So yeah, we need it all. There, there's, there's a reason for all of those things, but I know that last year when I looked, I'm like, oh dang, I, I said it, but I really didn't kind of explain it well. Hopefully that was better. Okay, so backgrounds, I don't know. I like to work with a lot of different substrates, right? Watercolor cardstock is my jam. Um, Mixed media is also my jam. Now, uh, mixed media heavy stock is kind of a very light looking, uh, it's not manila because it's not that, that yellow, but it's a very light color. This is the same surface that are in the Dilusion, Dilusions journals. If you, uh, if, I was trying to say Diane and Dilusions at the same time. Uh, if you're familiar with Diane's journals, uh, she's got this great paper in there and she was so kind enough to allow me to add this to my line. Mine is thicker than what's in the journal, so I have it in uh, sheets. It comes eight and a half by 11. It also comes four and a quarter. It comes in number eight tags. And this year, so excited, number fives. How great are these gonna be for, you've already seen, I'm sure a lot of the makers do treat bags or for Christmas. It's just a great uh, quality for inking tags because if you're new to the ink world, my advice is play with papers. You really uh, underestimate the importance of a good paper. A good paper can make uh, even, even bad inks better, right? But bad paper is gonna make even the best inks not work. So we're gonna work on that. And I'll start with just some normal backgrounds and then we'll get into uh, some textured stuff because they're sitting over here calling my name, okay? And I'll try to answer questions as we go. I'm also gonna have some sprays. Could I use ink pads instead? Absolutely. If you don't have any other sprays and you're doing this and all you have is ink pads, just know that when I'm using the spray, you could be squishing your ink pads down instead. I just think whenever I'm doing full backgrounds, uh, I, I just kind of like to stick with sprays. These guys, right? These are all gonna be, uh, I just chose different colors of spray stain. So these are gonna be true color, okay? And then I've got a few oxide sprays because well, they're amazing and I love them. And so I just, I pulled a few colors and just put it in in the tin for now. Thank you, Ranger, for having those labels because now they're, it's just dreamy knowing, knowing the colors that I have. For those that have labeled your stuff, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, so we're gonna get into uh, adding some color. I have a heat tool because I wanna be able to dry in between. I'll talk about that as I go. Uh, some type of sprayer, right, water reactive. So water is really going to give, I think, a lot more uh, reaction things to the products that we have and I like to work on something nonstick, okay, versus glass. If you only work on glass, your colors really tend to muddy together. So let's get to it and just talk about the backgrounds, okay? I'm gonna take all these off because, well, I'm just gonna use them all. So I'll take them, lay them on their sides. Hopefully they don't roll away too far, and off we go. They do. 
Yes, Julie, substrates all the time, all the time, all the time, and play around. It doesn't mean that these are the only ones they work with, right? But, it, but these are the ones that I asked Ranger to, to bring in, right, for me, because I found that these particular substrates perform the best. Like, I mean, having a 130 pound craft is way better than just thin craft paper, because thin craft paper, like a paper bag, man, your coloring just gets sucked in, it does nothing. Watercolor paper, I love having the ability of uh, the choice, I would say, of either a textured side or a smooth side, right? Most watercolor papers are either or, and they're often very porous. So this is kind of in between. And then this, because I started my little making journey with manila tags that are very yellow, uh, and I felt that that yellow tone always impacted my colors, right? If I tried to put a light blue on a manila tag, it looked green. This, even though it has a cream tone, and you're like, oh, that does look yellow, Tim. It is yellow compared to white, but not nearly uh, as yellow as it is compared to the others. All right, let's go. So pay no attention to how I'm shaking. You do you, right? You want to ring the bell. You want to shake up and down, right? Just you'll know if it's leaking all over your hand, you probably shouldn't do it that way, okay? And we'll talk about just spraying directly to a surface, okay? If I spray on dry paper, okay, I'm going to get that coverage is just going to go right onto that surface. It's going to be absorbed into it. If I choose to spray my paper first, just with some water, and I spray this, look at the difference. Okay, that's just one spray. See how it reacts differently? It wicks because distress, when we say water reactive in the distress world, we talk about wicking. We talk about this movement of the colorant actually flowing away from itself, but it maintains its color integrity. Okay. That's the beauty of water reactive, that when you hit it, it is supposed to move away from itself, but still cover the surface and maintain its color. This is the same color of green, even though I hose this down with water, right? It's just going to give you more of a flow or a fluid look versus just direct. So is there a right or wrong? Absolutely not. It just depends on how you want to uh, kind of achieve the effect you're going for in your background. Some people, you know, when they're new to sprays, they take paper and they spray it and it just looks like, you know, buckshot bill there. It's just like, boom, boom, boom. And your colors don't go together. And then you try to spray it with water and you're like, oh, why aren't they moving? Well, because that colorant absorbed into the paper first, and then you got a little bit of movement, but not enough. Maybe that's what you're going for. So we're going to keep playing around. So can I wet the stuff that I sprayed? Sure, I can do that. But you're going to see that even though I wet it and move it, where I sprayed, see those darker areas? That, that can't go away. You can blend the outer edges, but the intensity is what was attracted to the paper first. Okay? So now, what did I say? Oh, well, <laughs> you, I hope you know what I mean. Because if you've sprayed before, it was, like when I was new to sprays, I mean, you can ask Diane. Like I was so anti-sprays because I didn't know how to use them. And every time I sprayed something, it looked like I sprayed something. It was literally just like bullseye, 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 and I couldn't get blends. And then, you know, watching people that know how to do sprays, you learn a lot about like, well, they're actually cool, right? Because it does give you way more uh, spray pattern, different control. I just, I love the look of it. All right. So another great thing about a spray is using it as a spray, meaning we can, we can create different effects. So I can keep my distance, right? And I can create like little splatters of color and I could be good with that, right? If I'm going to die cut something, maybe I want something just kind of a little a little creepy freaky, or I can spray this to create a whole different effect in my background. Now the paper is going to arch because it's wet. Paper doesn't have a memory, so as it dries, it's gonna flatten out. But you can utilize this to your advantage. Let the inks do what they do. Like, look what's happening, right? We're getting just really great movement, and you can still pick up your paper if you wanna change the direction of, of the flow of that, okay? So don't, don't panic about this. I'm gonna spray this out just a little bit with some water over there. The other thing to know about this sprayer, you'll see that sometimes I commit and you'll hear that's like a full mist. And sometimes, I'll see if you can see it in my hand, I'll slowly squeeze the trigger, right? To create those dots, right? That's the nice thing about the sprayer. That little red dot, that doesn't come on here. That's just paint, but I like it. Isn't that weird? Kind of, I don't know why it's there, but I've left it. So let's dry. Now, when we dry, that's when you're gonna start seeing the, the shimmer or the mica. When we first just use these and they're wet, you don't notice the shimmer as much, okay? But when it dries, that's when it starts coming out. Now, obviously we've added a lot of water to this. So our shimmer should be dispersed way more than the swatches because the swatches were just saturated directly onto dry paper. But it's still gonna be visible, you'll see that. But just know of how we do it. Now I'm using a heat tool versus an embossing gun. 
If you only have an embossing gun, you can use it. But I recommend if you love to do ink techniques or mixed media, get a heat tool, right? A heat tool uh, is from Ranger, same temperature as an embossing gun, 340 degrees about, but this diffuses the heat. So this allows me just to point right on the paper. You don't, I'm not doing this, okay? Besides, you can hear the strain that it's putting on the fan. Just leave it there. You can move it back and forth, but see my paper starting to flatten down. It has no, no memory there, okay? So this is our background now. So look at that. We have that pearl, but do you see what I was saying about the textured part of watercolor paper and how if you use the textured side versus the smooth, it wants to sit in the pits? Yeah, maybe you like that. Maybe you don't, but know that you have an option that if, if you don't like these little specks in there, it's simply because that pearl, right, is a, is a solid and it's just resting into those little, those little notches in the paper, right? But still a cool background. Again, something that you could uh, stamp on. You could do all sorts of things with it, but I'm going to, I just want to play with a lot of backgrounds, ideas versus just one. Okay. When you go to clean this and I'm going to clean it, I'm working with a towel. You can use a paper towel or whatever you use in your art space. But don't go from the glass to the mat, because what you're going to do is you're going to push that ink up underneath this edge, right? Because this craft mat, it has a silicone back that sticks. Instead, you're going to start on this, go across and come off. It's all about the dismount, right? On the mat, off the mat. Then the glass, treat it separate, okay? Because if you get in this habit of just cleaning it this way, you'll start shoving so much medium underneath this that your mat will start to peel up. Okay. If that does, you can try to clean it, but really just kind of keep in mind, just wipe the mat off separate than the glass and it will, it will stay flatter longer. doesn't mean it's going to be eternity, but it'll just be longer. Okay. Let's keep going with just some different backgrounds and play around. Then we're going to get into textures and inks and all sorts of stuff. All right. I'm going to do a little, I'm going to do glass. There's some, there's some water on here. That's okay. We're going to go right on to just some craft without any water, just because I want a little bit more intensity here. See that little spray of yellow? There we go. Harvest Moon wants to, wants to get out there. All right, let's get some decayed in here. Okay, that's all you gotta do is just look. See how you don't see anything there? That means it's go time. All right, oh, decayed, how I love you. Okay, so for this, I'm gonna start drying it first. No water, because I really like what's going on with all of those colors, okay? I'm good with that to start. Once I started drying it, you can see that it's not crispy dry. Can you see that some areas are matte and some are still shiny? Okay, it's a great time to add water to get an effect, meaning I'm going to slowly squeeze the trigger and that's going to start creating these drips. Okay, and these drips, because that ink is still wet, is going to create some movement. But because I dried some of it, it's not going to blend all my colors together. Right? If you wanted to blend wet on wet blends, right? Wet on dry layers. So this is essentially like a layer of splotches versus blending all of my colors. And you may not like this effect, then don't do it, right? You can just use whatever, but, but going in and knowing when to add water and, and what it will do is a, a very cool thing. So you can see, this is kind of that movement that it's giving my background. Right? And I can play around with those drips. You can take them off if you want, or you can still move it around. Right? Utilize uh, gravity, really, to, to your favor. We can also use what's here. Right? So I can take this because most of this is dry, even though the edges are still wet, but wet on dry is gonna layer. So now if I go into what's wet here, it's going to layer this stuff on top of my background. You see that? And we'll go in and dry again. And don't, don't worry about how it's looking right now because I can always go and see this like weird, I don't know what that is, that shape. Hitting it with a little bit of water is just gonna soften those edges so it doesn't look like, you know, some sort of weird, weird shape. Instead, it's gonna look, I don't know, watermarked, I guess. Again, just going in, drying with a heat tool, just kind of moving it around because I wanna keep that area exactly how I have it. See that? So see that little edge? This is where mica stains really come into play and seeing it, okay? Understanding the mica stain, and again, if you, if you bought them last year, I still recommend going back last year and watching the video again. I found it very, very educational. Um, but what's interesting, you have to remember that on mica stains, the mica and the stain are one. So for example, here on Harvest Moon, that yellow, 
right? Because there was some yellow under there. Can you see how the yellow stayed together and the ember stayed together? So even when you start layering this, the pearl remains attached to the color. So even when things start to move, they don't turn into mud, they go together. So that yellow pearl will sit on top of that orange pearl, which is, is beautiful. It's a great, great background, okay? So keep that in mind when you're working with the background is that by adding water and what made this really cool outline versus little, little splotches, remember when I sprayed all the water and I said, oh, it's like a weird shape, okay? That big shape is what's pushing that color into a different pattern. Okay. And once you're happy with it, you can uh, finish drying it. If you want to layer it again, like all these little, these little drippity bits, they're nice. You can splash around like you're splashing in a puddle. But can you see the difference of how a nonstick mat treats the ink compared to glass, right? This is always going to give you little drips and spots. This is going to give you a blend. And if you push in here, which we could, I'm just not going to with this background, but I'll show you, right? If you... If you spray this, because you can, you can still work off of your glass. It's not like you can't do it, okay? But those colors kind of become one. Not bad at all, but certainly they don't remain separate like they do here. So just knowing, you know, which surface is going to do which thing, that's good. Because sometimes people are trying to do an inky background from the glass and they're like, oh, I end up with mud. I'm like, because that's what your color's doing, right? On glass, it always wants to go back together, right? Join, join back into the party. On here, it stays separate. You can still see where the ember is compared to Harvest Moon. It will maintain its distance, a social distance mat, right? Versus, you know, pretty much how everybody is now. All right, there you go. Well, you know what I mean. They just, I'm trying to say terms where you kind of really understand this is not wrong, right? I like, I like that color, but it happens to be colors that work well together, right? That yellow and orange. If this was a lot of other colors, it would be, well, pretty bad, okay? Pretty bad. But I could still go in, uh, and even if I don't have more spray, I can use ink blending, I could add some other things. But to me, just really cool background. So when I'm done, uh, I am a chronic heat tool user, I, I can't lie, I like to have things dry. Sometimes on this, I'll just let it air dry, because I, I like that fluid movement. But this, I'm just going to dry it the rest of the way, pretty much. And then anything here, like any extra little drips, you can also dab and remove. And by dabbing those, it's going to give you almost like these little ringlets, right? Just outlines it a little bit more where you lift up some ink, but not a great background. Beautiful to run through an embossing folder, right? Beautiful to run uh, die cuts through. Now, could you ink afterwards? Sure. You could do either or, but if you're inking an embossed surface, which I will, I'll show you that, uh, it's going to just, it's going to work differently because I'm just using water to clean this off again, on, off. Um, when you work on an embossed surface, now your color is going to kind of sit in uh, the little pit. So let's do that. Let's actually take one. Uh, where is my tin of stuff? Uh, I'm not going to lie. Crayon tins, like, you know, I'm sure if Ranger is like, wow, we sell so many crayon tins versus crayons. It is my tin of choice. I love this tin so much because I, look, it, I put all my stuff in it. I, ha I probably have maybe 20 of these in my studio because... I'll do like stuff that I would say is complete, right? So this is like maybe stuff that I've die cut one day because I was bored or stuff from a demo, right? Like things that I would consider complete that I can use. I have a tin of backgrounds, right? This is stuff from last year. Look at that. Oh, let's compare. Well, this is a different kind of cardstock, but yeah, cool. This is using ink, I'll show you. So these are all different backgrounds, right? Stuff with texture paste. So if I need stuff to, look at that one little foundry wax. It, it gives you a little bit of play. See, look at these backgrounds from last year. These were good. Look at those. These were all mica stain. That was like mica stain showing you everyday use. Um, but I have that. And then I have just like pre-embossed or pre-cut stuff that hasn't been inked because sometimes you just don't have the creative juju. It's just not happening. So I'd rather just sit there and emboss a bunch of things than do nothing, right? So now I have papers that if I want to add inks or paste or stuff to, they're ready to go. And I, I've said this many, many times. It's like compartmental crafting. That's all it is. It's like you can just break everything down in compartments. Of, ooh, look at that one. I love woven. Um, of maybe what you want to do and, and do different papers. Don't do it all the same because, you know, you might forget what you have and what you, what you do with it. Okay. I'll take this one out too. I'll take both of those acorns out. Oh, I love that multi-level. Anyway, and then this one, of course... A lot of die cut stuff and presslets, that sort of thing. But it's a, a great way to, to kind of sort, at least for, for my creative brain, and have stuff at the ready. 
Because I would say as a maker, if you don't have anything prepped and you have to actually make something from start to finish, that could take a long time because there's just too many options, right? Too many things to take out. I love this one. This is again, another favorite, that 3D folder of those leaves, but we'll do the acorns too. Okay. So on this one, we're going to go ahead and spray just so you can see uh, the difference in this. So I'm going to take a little bit of decayed. Okay. And spray that down. And this is on dry paper. It doesn't have to be, but I, I like how the colors go because I know that I can, I can change them later. Right. A little harvest moon. Oh, oh gosh. I do love that color. Right. A little burning ember. And I am going to go in with a little fortune teller. Right. Even though I know people are like, oh my gosh, purple and yellow make brown. And what's wrong with brown? It's good. Okay. So let's dry this. See what we have before we add any water to it. I'm not going to, again, not going to go crispy because I want to get a little bit of movement there. I don't, I don't want it to look, what did I say before? What did I call it? Whatever it was. I don't want it to look splotchy. I'm not quite sure who I called out for that, but um, I just don't want it to be splotchy. So I'm just adding like little bits of water, see little drips, and I'm going to move it because as long as you don't dry it complete, you're going to get some movement. Ah, oh, look at that. See, now I'm, I'm happy. Things are starting to, to kind of get a little bit more motion. I still need to get some of that. There we go. Oh, nice. Okay. Let's dry it. There we have it. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Now wait till you see when this dries. Because we're on craft paper, it's just going to look different than when it's going to be on white. They're a lot of fun. They really, really are fun. We're going to take you through crayons. There's so much to take you through today. Who knows how long we'll, we'll hang out, but there'll be demos throughout the season. So not to worry, but take a look at that. I mean, come on. That's just, that's beautiful. That finish and it would, it's just so easy. So imagine just having, you know, one day you just sit there in a box emboss a bunch of paper. Then next day you go in and just start spraying a bunch of backgrounds. And then the next day you die cut stuff and then you add stuff. And before you know it, you have 20, 30 makes done in a matter of a week because you didn't try to sit down and think through one, which just caused you to stop because I get it. That's that, that's the creative block. I mean, that's really truly what it is. You sit there and you're like, okay, I can do everything, but I'll end up doing nothing because I have too many ideas and none of them are fully cooked. Well, that's okay. That's my popcorn brain. You don't have to fully cook anything. But what you do need to do is do something creative because that's what's gonna keep you inspired to make, is doing something creative instead of overwhelmed and second guessing and just not appreciating really uh, the benefits of, of your skill being a maker. Come okay. on, butt chop though. <laughs> oh, that's what it was. <laughs> See, I knew, I knew I said something, okay. So when I went back in and I, I tapped onto the mat, you can see that that spray really didn't lift. So if you needed that to, to say re-wet, you could just spray it. See what I mean by water reactive? That's the, ban the benefit of distress. Water reactive means water makes it more intense. It's not diluting it, okay? But look what happened on the second layer. Do you see where I added a little bit of harvest moon over burning ember? That gave me a yellow pearl, right? A little bit of I mean, I love fortune teller over harvest moon because now I've got purple over that. Now, why did it layer? Because it was wet on dry. If you just sprayed it and then dipped it in everything, you'd get mud. So you need to dry it in between because you have these magical serendipitous moments of a different color of mica stain sitting on top of another color because we're dealing with a color and a matching pearl. And we haven't even introduced this, the sprays and, and the oxides yet. So this, Okay. I'm happy with this. So when you're happy with it, set aside, don't overthink the ink, right? Sometimes people think everything needs to be a creative casserole. Like, well, if there's something left, it's going in the pot. No, just, just take that and, and let's add this, right? I think that that's going to be, I mean, look at these backgrounds that we can get just from working on this, because again, these sprays are on this mat and these, the mat maintains its social distancing, its boundaries, <laughs> right? Okay. <laughs> What's that? Well, I like to say things that maybe people will remember uh, what is said. Okay. Ooh, see, I'm liking this. Now, this is my second dip. So at this point, right, kind of all bets are off. See the difference, but I still am very happy with it. If I wanted to add a little bit more yellow, we can, right? Now, I sprayed it here. So obviously, if I put my tag in there, it's going to look like a spray. So instead, I'm just going to add water. I'm going to break it up. 
right? So it looks like the rest of everything else. Just take my fingers and drag through it. You could wear gloves if you don't want to get color on there. But now when I go into that space, now I'm going to be able to really focus on having that yellow where I want it. See that? Creative editing at its finest right there. Two tags from the leftover background of this. So see what I mean? Like once you kind of get your thing going, you're off to the races. And, and whether it's tags or watercolor or anything, it's just really, really good about working with these pieces. And because these have been sprayed with water, we're getting a completely different, uh, I mean, this one is just is magic. And this was just, you know, you dip and go, you get what you get. I say that all the time. You get what you get and you don't throw a fit because if you overthink the ink, right? You're so critical about that space or that space or that space and you dip that tag like 10 times, it's a disaster. Instead, just dip it, flip it, dry it and be done because we can always go in and add little bits either with a brush or with a blending tool. But look at that background, right? That's something you wouldn't get on two or three dips. It would just get covered up. I mean, this is kind of what happened on that second generation. Not bad, but certainly not this, right? But look at that. See, I love how as that color builds up, right? Because we added water to this, our, our mica is a little bit more fluid, a little bit more translucent, where on this piece, it's just, there you go. Yep, dip it and flip it. Okay, nice. We'll just throw those over there. Again, going back in here, start here, over, over, down glass, wipe that off. If you don't want any color, a little bit of water, same thing, right? And I just use a, a flour sack towel from, I get them at Walmart because they don't have any lint to them and you're not going through uh, paper towels. I use paper towels, but I use paper towels for their absorbency when I need to pull something away uh, or if the medium is actually glue or paste, right? Because I don't want this to, you know, become a sculpture because you have so much crusty stuff on it, right? Okay. Right, Ted? Because <laughs> when, 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 I, when I would demo Ted, it's like I would take out a towel. I'm like, this is a sculpture. Stiff. Yeah, because he's like, oh, I clean up glossy accents and texture paste and everything with it. I'm like, it's like a board. I'm like, you should probably not do that. OK, speaking of texture, let's play around with some of these. So here's what I've done uh, from a prep. I've used a lot of different stencils. Uh, I love to just go through stencils and pick out some favorites. So here's what I've used. I'll talk about that and then we'll we'll see what happens. Right. Because, gosh, guys, where do you see? I have so much stuff. Oh my gosh. Okay. Texture paste translucent, texture paste opaque. Okay. So, texture paste, different than grit paste. It's designed to have a texture. This one is actually new. Texture paste translucent. Came out with it this year. What it is, it's like, think of it as like a textured glossy accents, right? You put it on with a palette knife and it dries with this amazing textured shine. Texture paste opaque is exactly what it is. It's opaque. This one is kind of like a sponge. What I love about this one is this is designed to accept color. Okay. This accepts color. This resists color. So I've got a, a few, like all the white ones you'll see, these are all texture paste opaque, right? Really cool. That's going to take the color. And then these texture paste translucent. Look at that. It's like glossy accents. Look at the great stencil. See, I like, because it's a paste, uh, you could do a resist spray, but resist spray is not going to give you the texture, right? Hence the name, right? Remember that, but resist spray is still cool, but texture paste is going to give you texture, right? Oh, that's upside down. Look at that. And I also like, because it is a paste, you can uh, get it to kind of skip around. And then I had to do some textures using uh, Crypt. This is a stencil, believe it or not, right? I think this is called maybe grime or something like that, because sometimes, and this would even work as the, as a beach, right? But sometimes you want to like put that paste on very splotchy, but the paste is thick. You can't really do that. So having a stencil uh, that does it, it just gives you such a, a great effect. And this, I love these kind of mosaic stones. Again, I've cut this apart. I don't know what I'll do with them yet, but again, you sit down like last night and you just paste a bunch of stuff, different papers, different paste, different stencils, who cares? Then you have it to, to play with when you're ready instead of getting everything out and going, okay, I got to get this and get this, but let's talk about how to put it through a stencil in case you don't know. Okay. When you put it through a stencil, first things first is you need to have the stencils. So I'll have them. I'm not quite sure exactly where I put them from last night when you brought them in all tidy. I know I put them in a place that I'll remember and then welcome to the demo. Here they are. <laughs> I'm like put them right, right next to you so you see them. Okay. So these are all the different stencils I used. This is that. I'll show you that one with all that little bit of no worries, that little grime. See, look at that one. This is number 130. See what I mean? 
right? Great for splatter and also still good for your ink pads and, and whatnot, okay? But let's say we wanted to do, I like these stars. It's a fun little swirling stars, okay? Um, I'll do translucent, just so you can see. The viscosities of these are completely different. And again, these are in that new shorter jar. Um, if you don't use your mediums very quickly, you should put a uh, press and seal in there or something to push down and, and create a barrier because as you use any medium, right, it is replaced with air in your jar. And so just because you have the lid on tight, and even if you put the jar in a Ziploc bag, you still have trapped air inside that jar and it will not last forever. Okay, but I use mine all the time so I can go through it really without the press and seal now that we have that shorter jar, right? I didn't like that big giant tub, but the viscosity is very different. This one is more like a buttercream frosting. Okay, that's gonna be opaque. Translucent is gonna be more like mayo, right? Mayonnaise or yogurt, completely different, but both of them uh, will work uh, for texture, okay? Here we are, let's take this and go over this. Now I'm just gonna go in with a palette knife. I like to work with plastic palette knives. You can use whatever kind of palette knife you wanna work with. Um, I prefer a plastic one. I like this little one that's got kind of that sports car uh, kind of shape and also that little flexibility, okay? Uh, these are from Ranger, right? They're just in the distress package because it's two, but these, if you have the Ranger ones that have like maybe five different ones, it's exactly the same knife. Um, if you have Dina, I think it's exactly the same knife, just hers are, are white, okay? So utilize whatever it is that you want. This is my favorite shape, okay? So I'm gonna pick up some texture paste translucent. It's gonna go from the bottom, right? So you're gonna, when you use your knife, you're gonna pick it up from the bottom because that's how we're going to apply it through the stencil, not like a spoon, okay? So just pick some of that up. Now, when you're working on this, again, you can work on the glass, or if it's something you need to wipe up, you can easily wipe it off of something nonstick. Now, depending on how you are with stencils, you might want to tape stuff down, all of that. I don't know about you, but I, I still hold it with my hand regardless. And if I'm doing paste, I find it, uh, it's pretty easy just to hold this for a second. So I'm just using this and I'm, I'm gently skimming over the top. That's why I want something plastic because I'm dealing with a plastic stencil and I'm spreading it down flat and gently skimming it off the side. So I'm, that's kind of the motion. It's flat, skim, flat, skim, okay? And I like the idea of a stencil just being a little bit more random, so that's why I have mine in a tag shape. And then all I'm doing is I'm just going, looking at the stencil, and if I see any big splotches, I'll just skim that off simply to save the medium, right? Because whatever's on the stencil is pretty much gonna go to waste, so I just skip that off. But I'm not going in scraping it really hard because that force could force that medium underneath your stencil, okay? This stuff could go back in the jar. The lid could sit on the top for right now. The stencil, we're just gonna lift it straight off. Look at that, that's what we have, okay? To clean the stencil, just clean it in water. I have a little tray, right? Called it the lasagna pan for years, but it's just a plastic thing that Mario got from something at Costco where my stencil fits, but just throw it in the water, okay? If you do that, you come back to it in say five minutes or so and all of that medium, that texture paste, any kind of paste is dissolved. And then all you have to do is take your stencil out and dry it, okay? You don't, and you might have to maybe do a little bit with your finger just to kind of move that off, but I'm gonna let that dissolve. I prefer that way versus immediately cleaning it with a baby wipe or something because you know that you kind of grab the details of your stencil and once you bend a stencil, well, it's, it's kind of all over for that. This, same thing. I'm just going to take it, dip it in the water over here, just to kind of get it wet. Now I am gonna go in with a paper towel because it's sludge and then just clean off the palette knife. So that's how you can apply paste to a stencil. It's really uh, quite simple. We're just gonna wipe this off with that paper towel. We're clean, ready to go. And I'm gonna let this dry. I don't like to force dry any of my paste with a heat tool because they puff up, they crack. You might like that, um, but I just set them aside. If you have anything going off the edge, see that little, that little lip right there, it's gonna dry like that. So if you wanna just knock it down with your finger first, right? Do whatever edits you need to do before you set it aside. Drying time, really, depends where you live. Depends where you live, depends on the weather, right? Set it aside, maybe it's gonna be 15 minutes, maybe 30, right? You could put a fan on it, but again, I don't like to do that. I just like to let it do what it does. Okay, let's go in and play with that now. We're gonna take this, we'll do this skull one. That'll be fun. Okay, cool. Cool, cool. Yeah. 
All right? And I'm going to take some spray stain as well. So we've got this guy, it's translucent. I want to create definitely more of a, a drippy, oozy look. So I'll start with a little bit of water first. I'm going to take some spray stain. And you can see when I talk about resist, see how the water just beads up on, on that? Okay. The thing you need to remember though, is even though something is translucent, okay, I'm going to take a little bit of oxide spray as well. This is old paper. So oxide is uh, a dye and pigment fusion. And it will oxidize, but it's going to give me a little bit of, of kind of a creamy effect. Okay. And it's cool because old paper is kind of a weird greenish gray. Well, old paper, right? I don't know what that color is. See, it kind of looks green, but it's a little brown. I'm going to throw that on for right now. We're just starting out with our layers. And then we're going to take a little bit of iron gate. I'm going to shake that up. Go into those areas. All right. And then we're going to start drying. Okay. So when I start drying, I'm going to pick this up just because again, I want, I want that drippage, that little bit of gravity to, to play, do a little bit of drying, trying to hold it up so you guys can see Then I'm going to go with my water bottle, start again, putting some, some drips in there. You can tap that. See, that's going to force that movement a little bit more and you'll start seeing the resist. It's, it is important depending on your paper. If you're ever trying to do a resist, if your paper is too thin, right? So this is distressed watercolor cardstock, but if your paper is thin and even if you have thick cardstock, if you oversaturate it, you would essentially get that color to go underneath your resist because it's only sitting on the top of the paper. So that's why if I'm spraying this, I want to get that thing going and get that ink dry because the longer it's sitting there wet, the more it's actually soaking into the paper and could in fact soak underneath the stencil, which wouldn't be a, a bad thing, but I, I am going to try to avoid it. Okay. Very nice. Very nice. So far, so good. I'll just show you where we're at right now. It's what we have so far, right? Cool. Very, very gothic and cryptic. Now, because this is dry for the most part, not crispy dry, but dry, just like before when I said, if you go in with drips of water, right now, it's going to just be more of a, of a reaction thing. It's not necessarily going to blend. It's just going to create more of a reaction. So I want to absorb this. So I'm going to take a paper towel, lay this down, lift this off. Okay. That's what, and I'll use this until it, there's not much left. Okay. I'll dry it again. Mm -mm -mm. Look at that. So good. So, so good. And I'm going to keep playing with this, right? So once it's dry, I'll go back into some of the stuff that's here. Okay. I'm not going to go over here. We already know maybe the, maybe a tag can go there. I mean, if I wasn't doing a demo, pretty much I would take any scrap of paper and, and mop this up. But for demos, I pretty much like to just clean up. So you guys see that. All right. Again, drawing that. Dab some of this off. Okay. Now let me clean this. Not finished yet, but I just want to clean off a bunch of this sludge there. There we are. Okay. So let's go back to this guy. So here. I'm going to drip more water because I want to add more water drops to this. I'm going to dry it for just a few seconds. When you dry water drops, right? Not completely, but when you dry or even ink drops, but any kind of drip before you blot it off, it will create an outline of that shape a little bit more. And I'll show you what I mean when I hold it up to the camera. You see that? So that little outline definition was just because instead of spraying it with water and immediately dabbing it off, I went in and dried it for a little bit, which just kind of gives it a chance to almost draw an outline around that drip. And then I still went in and, and took this off. Okay. So now we're going to do a little splattering Let me take a, my splat box right there. I love my splat box and I'll take spray stain. This is black. Just going to spray that right there on the mat. Now you could, I've seen people, you know, take the stain and actually, you know, try to spritz it on or unscrew this and use a little schnozzle to create drips, whatever works for you. Uh, I always find that that just gives me more than I want. I'm just taking a splatter brush right through that stain in like a sweeping motion, pull this back from the middle and I'll just start splattering this on, right? Oh yeah. Yep. 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 And the stain is already the perfect viscosity. So I don't need to, you know, I don't need to add water or anything like you would if you were splattering with paint. Okay. Pick this out. 
so you can see it. It's like working with, I got it. There we go. <laughs> there we are. Just some splatters. That's good. I agree, Mel. Your splat box is, is art in and of itself. Absolutely. Now, I chose to do stain because I wanted the splats to kind of go into the background, right? So that's an ink. If you wanted them to be more pronounced, then you would want to splatter with paint, right? Because paint would sit right on the top, whether it's white or black or anything. But you'll see here by just doing a little bit of that ink. I'll go in again one more time with a, a paper towel. Right? Just to take off anything extra that's not... Jeez, not much there, but I love how that ink goes into that paste because I dried it over the top. See that little shine, right? Because I dried the ink on there. So I just think it's really good. Now, if I were to wet this, okay, I'll show you on, on one of these. This, is, it will, this will always remain water reactive. That's the other thing about uh, ink versus paint. If you splatter with paint and the paint is dry, it, it's done because distressed paint is permanent when it's dry. But because this is ink, if I wanted to go in with a, a damp paper towel, I can wipe this guy completely clean, right? Takes all that off. So dry to the touch, but if it gets wet, right, with water, right? Or if you lick your art, which I always remind you, don't lick your art, you can bring that back. So let's just say this guy, you're like, hey, you know, he got a little too covered. I love the ability to just a damp paper towel and just go in and edit. And you can, you can kind of do that to most of them, you know, bring back whatever elements. You don't have to wipe it off clean, but it gives you the ability to just go in and bring some of those out and highlight. Pretty fun, right? I do love the idea of, of working with inks in this way. Now, if you take a look at the background now, here's what's really interesting. So just to give you a quick review of what we used, we used spray stain, that's black, that's gonna give us that saturation of color. We used oxide spray in old paper, that's what's giving it kind of that greenish, almost kind of milky look to the black. And then we went in with Iron Gate, which is the mica stain, right? So we essentially have a colorant, a colorant with pigment, and a colorant with pearl or mica. So now when the background shifts, you're going to see some areas that are more saturated in color, some that have a little bit of shimmer. You see that where that mica stain breaks up and then some that has that green opacity of, of that oxide spray. Very cool. Do you have to use all of them? No, but can you? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And it's, it's really fun. It's great to just go in and create these effects. And again, what are they? Well, it could be a background. It could be something that uh, you use as a foundational piece. You could just have a die cut word over the top, right? Boo. And it's a, it's a Halloween card. But my point is this would be another part of my compartmental making, if you will. Right? So it's just good. How are you going to cover the product to protect it when it's safe to mail? It is safe to mail just like this, as long as you put it in an envelope, right? So, like nothing's going to come off in, in friction or anything. I mean, and let's face it, if, if your mail gets wet, it's going to be more than your ink that you're worried about because your card will be a lasagna. So I just think that if you, if you put it in uh, an envelope, you're going to be fine. If you have any embellishments, maybe a little bit of bubble wrap. I've seen people do bubble mailers, but you don't have to worry about uh, your inks or mediums. If they're dry to the touch, they're going to be dry to mail. Okay. So just something to, to keep in mind. And some people, you know, distress is really not meant for, for sealing, right? I don't seal. We don't, we don't talk about sealing here. Like we, we, start, we start singing the Bruno song, but yeah, we don't, we don't do much sealing here. You could, there's a microglaze that you could go over it, but microglaze would also essentially do what that damp paper towel did to these skulls, which would be to take that off. Um, but you can also, you know, if you, if you really wanted to make sure that maybe nothing got scratched off in that area, you could put a piece of tissue paper over that before you put it in an envelope. But honestly, I wouldn't worry about uh, the work, right, that you did. Unless you just want to frame it and give it to someone because I also think stamped art should be frameable, right? All right. So that was translucent. Let's, let's go into one that has texture because that's just going to be fun. We'll do, the, we'll do the starry one. Ooh, we even did one with some bats on it. That's cool. Let's do this one. So this one's dry. This one I did earlier, right? And I think it's going to be great to, to add some different colors in this one as well. So let's take, ooh, yeah. Let's take a little bit of Uncharted Mariner. That's going to give us a nice little deep blue in there. We'll also take a little bit of Iced Spruce spray stain, and then we'll, we'll add our mica, okay? So for this, I'm going to start with a little bit of water because I want my colors to, to be a little bit more fluid, okay? So we'll go in with Uncharted. Oh, gosh. 
so good. Now, one thing I'm doing off to the side, I have my towel sitting there. Anytime I'm done with a spray, I always touch it on the towel just to clean off uh, whatever might be left on the nozzle just before I put it away. If you, you don't have to do it every time that you're spraying, but when you're done for the day, it's just a good habit to get into, right? Just to make sure that you, you know, your sprays stay as clean as possible. And now we're gonna dry it. We're gonna add a lot of layers to this, but again, if I were to spray all my colors on here, wet on wet blends, right? So if you put yellow into blue, it's gonna be a green background because it's blending. So by putting these colors down first, and drying it, whatever I put on top will now layer because wet on dry layers. Just an important thing to remember. And if, if you don't like to use a heat tool and you're a multitasker, you could essentially spray this, set it aside, spray another one, and then come back to it when it dries. Just really up to you uh, when, you're, when you're working with inks. But it's those little tips that I think sometimes we forget when we're working and we're like, why is everything such a hot mess? Because I think you're so eager to get it done, right? That you, whoa. Oh no, well, I have no idea. Hey Siri, stop music everywhere. Gosh, I have no idea. It was playing Disney, yeah. Thanks, I, I never know what I say to get that to go. All right, uh, but what if you want to seal it? You would, if you want to seal it, you would want to use a spray sealer called a workable fixative that you could spray on by Krylon uh, and that would be a workable fixative. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure a hairspray would, would work, but that would be my, my best guess is using a workable fixative because those are designed for mediums uh, that allow you to seal uh, a wet surface or watercolor, often pastel as well. So here's just that spray mixed with a little bit of water. I did dab it, but see by letting that ink sit there, you see how it started to absorb into the paste? This is where a texture paste opaque comes into play because unlike translucent, it doesn't act as a resist. It acts like a sponge. So it takes the color exactly how you give it. Adding a little bit of that water to the paper first also gave me more of a fluid movement, which pushed my ink into the places that it felt safe to kind of get absorbed into that space. All right. So that's just a good background. I think I'm going to work with that ink here. So I'll just take a little bit of water, add some down here. I'll break it up. So I'm going to get just a, a few more spots and then I will dab onto that. Dab, dab, see? So now I'm just getting those drips. So by breaking it up, you can see those little water drips, I'm getting that, and I'll dry that. I like that, it gives it really, really interesting things. So are there going to be maker samples this week? Not for this, because believe it or not, the makers have been using this product in all of their makes for the brand. So uh, last week for Sizzix, there were several makes using uh, this seasonal launch ideology that we have next week also use there's some makes that use this seasonal and then when we get into stampers anonymous also makes that use this. so the makers instead of just this was more about education uh, the makers have already been using this product in their makes for the other three brands balance right very good so here we have this background i'm going to go ahead and wipe this off and I think if you go back to Sizzix, especially, you know, if you've seen this, you could recognize a lot of these products now that, you know, maybe, uh, again, like I mentioned, Paula's tag that she did last week where she did the crayons over uh, this background, right? Because the crayons also, magic, let me, let me grab them. I have no, I have no problem getting, getting a little derailed on this, right? So just on craft, you could ink this first, you could do oxide. I mean, there's so many uh, beautiful things that we could do for this one. We're going to take a little salvage patina oxide spray on this craft first. We'll, we'll multitask both because I'll let this dry a little bit. Um, and we'll spray this down. Look at that. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay. Wipe that off. And I'm just going to let that, just tapping this down so that that starts to just drip a little bit. Okay because I just wanted to kind of get in all the grooves there. I'm going to leave that space open. Why? Mm, because. Just because. Uh, maybe I'll go back and ink it or do something else. But, you know, sometimes I like to leave a little, a little space. It's also very cool when, you when you're sending it to people uh, so they can truly appreciate what you did, right? So I'm going to give it just a little dry because I want that color to set, but then I'm just going to give it two sprays of water. Did you see when I sprayed it, how it changed? If not, if you're watching the replay, you can go back and see it, but spraying it oxidized it because oxide is a fusion of dye and pigment, both the spray and the pad that once it's wet, it will oxidize. If it's not wet, it will just remain its pigment. Okay. 
and I can oxidize it as many times as I want. The more water you add, the brighter or lighter it gets. So here I've just, I've dried it a little bit. Watch, I'll do it again. See how that just made that a little bit brighter? So very, very cool. And so this is just gonna give it a, a neat little chalky finish so I could add some of the crayons to it. You don't have to do this. You could just put the crayons directly on paper, but it's nice to have just some different colors. Look at that. See, it's just, it's like, I don't know. It's like stucco. It's so cool, All right? All right. Then if you wanted to go in with your crayons, you could go direct. So the crayons are very creamy. So we could, we could add the color direct. We can smudge this out with, with your finger, or you can just scribble some down on the mat also pick it up with your finger and then just go in and kind of burnish the top or you could watercolor but if you watercolor keep in mind that you're going to re-wet that oxide and it's going to kind of get mixed up right but you can also layer but see that see just rubbing that crayon over the top of it it's just it's that beautiful purple metallic sheen just using your finger over an embossing folder so simple so simple right and so by working on this, it does just give me a little bit more uh, kind of play, but the crayons dry. So they have a drying time. So it's not going to be something that's just going to stay wet. So that again, why you wouldn't need to seal them because they're going to have a little bit of a drying time. If you, if you wanted to mix colors, we could do the same thing, right? We could take a little bit of, here's some burning ember. All right, I can pick up some of that and I can add some of that onto that purple. All right? I wanted to take a little bit. See, I could just, when I, that's flickering. Let's use Harvest. It's, it's very hard to not use the colors from all the crayons in the box, right? I want to be, I want to be considerate of that. All right. So there's some, there's three colors on there, but look when the light hits it, you see all three different colors of pearl, the purple, the yellow, and that orange. So it is really fun to just go in and accent a card and drawing time on crayons. I would say a few minutes, right? Maybe I don't know, maybe five minutes or so when they're dry enough that you don't have to worry about it. So you, you have, and I'm saying like, as far as open time for blending, you have a few minutes, but not really forever because they, they dry pretty quick like this. It's already dry. I mean, you could try to pick it up, but it's not going to be nearly as easy as coming right out from the crayon, right? So it's much better to just scribble a color as you need it. So you can pick that up. Uh, you could work on the glass, the glass, the thing about uh, working on that is it doesn't want to take the crayon as well, right? It doesn't put down as much pigment. It puts some down, but not as much, but you can, again, you do you. This could still be watercolor though. So if I took a, a water brush or a paint brush, I could pick this color up. Boy, I have, I'm going in all sorts of different directions on this demo. I like that though. Keeps me going, right, Mario? Right. Keeps it savvy. Okay. Let me get this stuff. I'm gonna close this. Get this out of my way. All right. So you could take a brush. Oh my gosh. Okay. Are you kidding Here's me? Hey, stop. <laughs> Siri, stop. What am I saying? I think maybe because we're saying so much, we don't talk about ceiling. <laughs> okay. uh, so, oh my gosh. I think it's still going. Look, I can pick this up with water and you could watercolor this. Okay. Hey, Siri, stop everywhere. <laughs> oh my gosh. I think I'm going to unplug it next time. That's so funny. It literally is right next to me. All right, but a great watercolor. So any of that leftover, if you wanted to do something else, again, multitask uh, as a maker. So that's the nice thing about picking up the color. If you're going to try to, to, I'll say dry brush, just keep in mind, if you do this with water, right? And you try to watercolor with this, you, you could try that, but it's going to re-wet that color of oxide and it's going to, to kind of make it mucky. But if you didn't, right? So let's just say, you know, you wanted to highlight an area down here, you could then just pick it up and color directly onto craft. That would be fine. So you could certainly watercolor on paper, but if you already had ink, you would want to seal it. Now, if you just had ink, you could go over it with distress microglaze and seal it, right? But the distress microglaze, you would then need to dry it before you watercolor. Again, a whole demo just on, on microglaze and sealing, but options, we have options. Okay. We're going back to this. That's fun. A lot of cool things. I need, to, I need to finish that one too in my head. Okay, so this one, remember texture paste. We had spray stain, right? Uncharted and uh, ice spruce. And now we're going to take our mica stains. Okay. And this one, little harvest moon. 
So this I'm gonna keep my distance. And because of that, I think I'm gonna take the splat box because I wanna catch any of the, the overspray. But instead of spraying close, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back here because I am gonna just try to get a little bit more color down, a little bit more splatter, okay? Oh, thanks, <laughs> Anita. Okay, well, there you go. That will be the words. Okay. You can't say it. We can't talk about that either. All right, so there I just sprayed some on. You see that? Got that little splatter. So that's more than a splatter brush would put down. And really what I'm doing is, um, I'll move this out of the way so you can see what I'm doing off camera. I'm keeping my distance, okay? I'm making sure this is really shaken. But instead of committing to the spray, like one, I'm just spraying it down slower and it's going to get, see, it just gets it to like spit out some of the color, okay? It's a bit messier, but I like the, I like the effect. Oh, I'm glad I didn't use that color because I didn't want burning ember. I want, I want a little bit of, of this purple. Now, before I go in and add fortune teller, because I don't want purple and yellow to make brown, I'm going to dry that yellow, right? Because wet on dry is going to layer. So it's really important that we just go in, dry a little bit of that. And this is beautiful. I'll hold it up before I add another color just so you can see. Uh, again, it's, it's almost like pixie dust. See, look at that. Look at just that beautiful yellow mica over that blue, right? A whole little magical, little magical look, right? I like that. But I still want to add a little bit of purple. Not over, not to the whole thing, but just some, okay? Again, shake that up and keep our distance and just, just add a little bit, just a few little splatters. Not much. I'm just kind of moving uh, off. I'm just kind of doing this, but from my distance because I want it to just fall in different, in different spaces. Okay, there you go. That's good for me. You can always go back and add, but you can't, you can't remove. So you see those little splatters right there, right? I'm gonna move that out and we're gonna dry it. Once you get really comfortable with the fact that you can always go back and add more and layer, I think you'll enjoy the process more. It is about a process. It is about playing around with the colors, letting things dry. Don't be afraid of the ink going through, uh, and drying it and see what you get, right? There's many, many times that, you know, uh, as a maker, it's just that anticipation of having it done, so you just throw everything down, right? So if you, if you throw everything down at once, you just get mud, and it's so important. I mean, I, I say this all the time, and this is not a Tim Holtz tool, right? It's a Ranger tool. I love this tool. I've used it my entire creative career, honestly, because it was the thing that I found that allowed me to go to the next step right away. I, I joke many times when I've demoed a show, if I could wear it on a holster, I would, because it's so important to understand that by drying it, especially in this medium, there's not every medium you have to dry, right? In, in Dina land, right? If you're a fan of Dina Wakely, she like anti-heat tool, <laughs> you know, she, she wants to see the process of, of, of paint and stuff moving into itself. And that is totally true for that medium. For inks, especially if you want to layer, you won't achieve this isolation of color if it goes onto a wet background. It would just wick into itself. But look at that, that's beautiful. So here's one other magical trick to texture paste, right? Working with uh, the matte texture paste, or the opaque, sorry. It used to be called matte, we changed it to opaque. Um, the opaque texture paste. The benefit of this is that even though it takes the color, right, it absorbs. So you can see here that those stars are just as dark blue as the background, right? That's just as light as the background. It takes on uh, the properties of the paper, the paste will also give it back, which is crazy cool. So I'm gonna go in with a paper towel, some water, okay? Because I want this to be porous. I want to be able to kind of lift that off and these are water reactive. So they have to get wet to react to let go. A dry paper towel will do nothing, okay? So a damp paper towel and I'm just going to touch over that area, press down, lift, press down, lift. And I'm just, see, it's absorbing, it's giving back that color and i don't have to do this everywhere i could but i'm not going to i'm just going to go over to the areas that i think maybe the stars are a little dark and see how it's just picking up that color it's also picking up the mica stain so don't don't freak your freak that's the cool thing about this it's going to allow it to to take color and give it back you also want to go into clean parts of a paper towel because if you have blue and you go back down you're essentially putting it back down uh, onto the paper so let's just go here. I'm going to hold it one more time right in the middle, a little bit longer. Look at that. So see how it just highlighted those stars a little bit more. It just took some of the color off. It didn't change the background, in my opinion. It didn't change it, 
but it highlighted the stars that I wanted to see more. Because remember, these were dark. These took on uh, that swirl of the paper. So it is nice that a damp paper towel over opaque texture paste will give the color back when you want. <laughs> really, really nice. Oh, cool background. Yeah, a lot of fun. A lot of fun to do. Okay. Speaking of backgrounds, another thing that we can do, and I shared this last time, but I always want to remind you when you're working with stuff like, you know, have a good time with, with your product. So every time I pick up the stain, by having them laying down, it's very quick to mix them up, right? That's why I don't have to shake them for a long time. But I'm just going to spray some of that mica stain out. Let me get these out of the way, get this black soot out of the way. And then I'm going to go in uh, with a brayer. Okay, so these are distressed brayers. This rubber is a little different. I've done an entire demo on these if you want to learn. But if you don't have these, try with the brayer you have. I'm not saying you, this is the only brayer that's going to work. But this rubber is designed specifically for distressed mediums to grab onto better. But you might have a brayer that works perfect. So before you run out and buy a brayer, make sure you, uh, you have one that, that doesn't work before you think you need another one. All right. It comes in two different sizes, a little sports car, medium one for maybe tags or something, a little wider one. It does have feet, so when you set it down, put it on the kickstand that keeps the brayer off the surface, and then it's very easy to push out with your thumb, remove the roller, and clean it. So I use it to brayer on collage medium if I want to have a very thin layer of glue that a brush isn't going to achieve, but it's also very cool for fluid mediums like this because we can take a, a background, right? It could be a piece of cardstock, it could be a tag, it could be whatever we want it to be. Uh, and we're just going to pick up the color. So when I pick up the color, the feet are up, the brakes are off, okay, so to speak. And I'm just going to roll through uh, this stain, all right? And you're going to see that it just picks up on the edge, okay? I want more. You can tell already I want more because I talked too long and you can see, ooh, splatter, that it dried. So I want more. Here's what I want. Ah, that's what we want. Okay. So you see those little drips that go around the roller? It's very important, and I'm going to use this before I do it, and then I'll show you what not to do. Okay, I'm just going to take this and just drag this down a background. Okay, just gives like a cool, especially for Halloween, <laughs> it just gives it a cool kind of grimy uh, background texture that's a little bit, it's just it's a cool way to apply ink. Could you wet this? Yes, let's do another one where you wet the paper first so you can see the difference. Uh, where do I want to draw it? I'll put it over here. Okay, here's what you don't want to do when you're doing stain. Okay, meaning if you have, let's just I'm not going to use this stuff, but let's just say that was all stain. Okay. When I go to pick up a wet medium with a brayer, I just let the weight of the brayer go through it and it's going to pick up the drips. Do you see that? Even water, it's going to pick it up that way. If you go in with a brayer and you treat it like you were picking ink off of an ink pad, which is pushing, you're pushing all your color off the brayer and your brayer is essentially clean. So if you're ever trying to get a fluid ink on the brayer, it's only sitting in one spot. You just want to gently roll through it and let that thing just spin around. And that's what's going to pick up drops all the way around versus pressure. Pressure is what you do if you're going to, you know, pick it up from an ink pad. So just, just a very important tip when you're working with a fluid ink and a brayer. Let's clean this off. Gosh, it's hard to do. I want to just go in with paper and but that's okay. We won't. Let's take this color again. And I'm going to mix it with a little iron gate. Oh, see, they're going. They're going. We'll take this piece of watercolor cardstock. I'm going to spray it with water this time. First time I didn't, this time I did. Uh, you'll see the difference, right? So again, rolling through it. Ah, oh, look at that. See, look at those great little, and I'm just kind of mixing those two colors together because I have a little bit of purple, a little bit of that gray. See, I've got all those cool different size drips. That's what we want. And then we're just going to roll through that. Look at the difference, okay? The cool thing about this is even though we're using a brayer, right? And even though we're essentially just kind of doing the same thing, I'm going to get a whole different effect on my background. And I'm still just taking my brayer and moving that ink around. But do you see how quick that saturated my background, right? Instead of spray, 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 or blah, blah. It's a super simple way to saturate a background using a brayer. Okay. Now, as I'm drawing this, I'm going to keep going in and I'm going to add another layer, right? Because now that it's drying, it's going to give me the effect that the first background did, which is going to give me those drips and those lines. And I'm just using the same stuff that's here, but my background is lighter because my background was wet.
All right. Very, very cool. All right. Let's take a look at this. Right? So what happened is the background that was fluid on wet paper gave me a really nice blend of the color. The top layer where I put it on dry really grabbed all of that mica and just gave me a beautiful finish, but a great texture. So imagine, you know, if purple's not your color and you want to do this in different colors with, uh, with green and, and gold and any of that, and you have a whole mixture of colors because you can do this with many colors. You could have some yellows and some orange and brown. Do all of this mixing, okay? And die cut this. Imagine having leaves, or in this case, for this, it could be stars, or maybe you're going to run this through an embossing folder now, right? Because you would want to do this flat and then emboss it and imagine all of that great texture because we still get the pearl because the pearl is fused onto the paper. That's the other thing to know about mica stain, right? It is fused on there, but isn't that great that the brayer is what is laying this down in this type of, of pattern. It just gives you a, a different texture. That's the whole point of kind of showing all of these demos is that sometimes when you think of sprays, you just think spray. And, and yes, that's how you apply. It's how you get it out of the bottle, but you could do spraying backgrounds. That's cool. Great effect, right? You could do it over something textured, gives you a completely different effect. You can press into it, gives it that effect, right? By pressing into it, because that's what we did. Remember, that was a leftover step. You could incorporate different textures, right? So paste is going to, the translucent's going to resist. That's going to give it opacity. And then, of course, a brayer. A brayer is going to give you a completely different uh, striation of color, whether you're doing it this way or whether you did it on dry. And let's go back to this dry one right? Because remember, this was put on the dry paper. Beautiful as it is, but let's say you wanted just a little bit more going on there, okay? I'm just going to spray this with water. So it's dry now, but by going in and adding water, it's going to react the color, okay? But it's essentially going to keep most of those big marks because that's what went into dry paper. So it kind of fills in the blanks, right? So that's another thing that we could create with is it does fill in the blanks on this, so I'm still gonna get those big kind of striations of color because I put that on dry paper. But now I get more of a fluid look because it's going to re-wet that stain because Distress is water reactive. It wicked, it filled in the blanks fast. You didn't see me hosing it down to where it was dripping everywhere. Beautiful, beautiful color. Yeah, Fortune Teller is just, because when it goes on straight, it gets it's really, really intense. And I'm, you know, of course I'm showing like fancy colors. I would be doing this all day long with Decade and just living my best life, right? But take a look at that. So this is more fluid. Why is this more fluid than this? Because the pearl, when it was wet, is just moving around. That's what gave it fluid. This one, remember, this was put on with the brayer. So two totally different effects, both very good. This one has more white space. So it has like, to me, a little bit more depth. I like having that white space. But this one's also a great background if I was going to die cut things because I'm, I'm, I could utilize like every, every inch of this paper to have some color. So, but really interesting, really great thing to work with, you know, how, it, how it's working with uh, a brayer, okay? And you could do the same thing with stain. You could do the same thing with your ink pads if you want, but your ink pads, you'd have to squish, spray, and roll, and you don't get nearly the saturation you would of, of a stain. So to clean your brayer, uh, it's very easy to just take something I normally would take a, a baby wipe right but just anything wet I prefer to take this right so I'm going to grab the roller with that push out remove it from the handle and just clean it this way it's so much easier than like rolling 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 on a on a baby wipe yeah because this just allows me just to truly clean it off and now it's it's good to go then you just pop it right back in so I do like that effect uh, the brayer. There's a whole video on those two. So a lot of fun. All right. Look at all this purple. Let's, let's clean this up. Let's keep going. Hope you guys are enjoying this. I'm having a ball. I do love, I love just working with stuff and hopefully, you know, even kind of reminding you about working with, uh, just working with your mediums a little bit different. So let's, let's cross over to the dark side a little bit. Let's get a little grungy. We're going to work with some uh, some decayed. We're going to work with some backgrounds of a little bit more on the grungy side and mixing mixing our colors together. Okay, so one of one of my favorite backgrounds or textures, I would say, 
uh, that we launched with the Sizzix Halloween is the Skull 3D Folder. It's not for everybody, I get it, but I love it and that's really good. And, and I wanted to see how this would work with the new wood grain, right? That new two-tone wood grain, because the wood grain cardstock, it's just, it's amazing. So it is a black cardstock, okay? It is smooth on the back. You can see the, the design in it, but it is in fact smooth. But the other side is a textured wood grain and the color has already been debossed into this. And the color that they use is already permanent. So you can use your inks, your paints, your crayons. You can do anything over the top of this and you're not gonna re-wet any of that color that's there, okay? I love this paper. It is only seasonal. It's not going to be part of the everyday line. It, it, that's, it is what it is, right? Um, when you, the paper only comes just in a, a, a 10 pack, right? I think it's size, let me just go into my, mat right here and just oh use that corner let's see five by seven there you go just square it up there yep five by seven sheets because really wanted to kind of cut apart but take a look when i took this paper and i embossed it using this folder now it wouldn't have to be skulls if skulls are not your thing my point is imagine taking any folder and look at that where it just looks like it's been carved or relieved out of wood nothing else done to it, just the paper. I did spray this paper, right? Give it a spray on each side, run it through uh, your folder, and it's just amazing without doing anything to it. So to me, this is really going to come uh, in handy for a lot of different backgrounds because I like, look at that. Look at that happy accident. Again, that knot hole right in his eye. <laughs> I like that. But very cool to, to just use the paper for what it is, all right? And just a, like a little teaser, there is a two-tone coming out for Christmas that's completely different. It's beautiful. It looks like birch wood. Magic, all right? So this one is just going over this same embossed paper with white. And what I'm using is, is Picket Fence. And I talked about this in the Sizzix Live last Saturday uh, when I did it. And there were a lot of people like, what, Picket Fence? I, I only thought that that was the crayon and the paint. I'm like, it's really a distress ink that thinks it's an oxide because there's not an oxide version because there really shouldn't be an ink version. Uh, picket fence uh, existed before there was even oxide. It was the idea behind oxide. And what it is, it is a white pigment ink in a felt pad. Okay, so this doesn't have any other type of colorant. So there is no oxide version. There doesn't need to be because uh, white is not a dye, it's a pigment. So that's why it should just be called Distress Picket Fence. But here we are. It also comes in a spray stain. So there is a picket fence spray stain. And it's just neat because it's a nice white. And it compares very different to, to all sorts of different things. So I always kind of keep this little sample so you can see the intensities of white and why I really love working with picket fence, right? So if you work with the ink, that'd be this, okay? You can apply it direct, but you can also wet it out to kind of get that nice little fluid, but it's very intense from the ink pad. If you do this with the spray stain, which is spraying some of that picket fence and watercoloring, you get much more of a translucent wash, not nearly as opaque as this. If you go into the crayon, now we're just dealing with pigment. When it blends, it almost blends into nothing, right? So you're, you're kind of losing this ghosty in between because this is just pigment, right? There's something in this. I'm not sure what the chemist used, but this to me washes out. And then of course, paint. Paint is going to always be your most opaque, most white, most everything. Uh, but you can wet it out while it's wet to get a blend. But once it dries, it's permanent. These can all be re-wet. So what I like about using the ink pad is I was able to get like kind of all this in between. That's why I think a swatch is really handy because if I just tried to go over it with paint, everything would just be that white. And I love that this casts these shadows. So it's, I'll show you how, it's just easy to use, okay? <laughs> you just take an ink pad. We're gonna take our picket fence and you could do this with an oxide if you wanted a different color, okay? But we're just gonna swipe over the top of it. Just go in direct. I'm not using a lot of pressure. I am just gonna go in different directions though because a 3D uh, actually sculpts or contours a folder. So just one direction uh, is gonna give you a linear look, right? But if you just kind of, like I'm not sitting there twisting it. You just see that I kind of went a few different directions. I just wanna catch a couple of other, other high points. I'll take a dry paper towel just so I can, I'll just burnish this a little bit. A dry paper towel, what that's gonna do while this ink is wet is that's what's gonna give me that little smudge. So you see this layer, how it, now we get a little bit of that ghosty kind of smudge. A dry paper towel is going to do that while the ink is wet. Obviously, if a wet paper towel, it would react and go everywhere. We don't want that. And now I'm just gonna go one more layer, just in a couple of spots. And that's what's going to add those highlights. And those highlights, 
See those brighter areas like around the cheekbones or right up here or right here in his teeth? I'm gonna leave it like that, right? You can let it air dry or, you know, in my world, a heat tool, <laughs> right? You don't have to use a heat tool. You can let it air dry, but it's just that simple. It's done. And that's what I like about working with picket fence. Again, if you don't want white and maybe you want these to be like more bony color and you want to use antique linen or you want to use a, a green uh, color like shabby shutters or old paper, right? An oxide, you could do exactly the same thing. Put it on, rub with a dry paper towel. And then if you want to add those highlights, just hit that again. Those little skippity bits. Cool though, right? Because the wood grain undertone, that to me is is the magic. And I didn't share that last week because, well, wood grain was getting its time this week. Okay. But let's talk about what else you could do with wood grain. Well, it's just a great paper to cut. Um, Vicki did a, a great social make that she shared on Instagram where she did the, the candy corn from Trick or Treat uh, cut out of that. And I was like, who knew that I would love a candy corn that I couldn't eat? But I do love that because it just looks like this carved thing. So it's really an interesting paper that you can die cut a shape and then it's going to make that shape look like well that it's cut out of wood but it doesn't mean that we can't go in and add any type of of colorants to it so let's add a little bit of decayed right let's let's take this paper and just add add a little bit of magic now i want this to blend i want this to move so i am going to wet this now unlike an embossed paper with an embossing folder it is it's a much more subtle texture okay so i'm just going to add a little bit of that I'm going to take a little bit more water just to kind of manipulate that a little bit and let's dry it okay now this is a printed paper with ink so it's not like we did an inked background so you can see already i can tell that mica stain is starting to bead up i'm going to say it's beading up because it's going over a printed surface so i'm going to just try to knock those down by just dragging that across see that and that's going to push some of that stain inside i just personally, I prefer that look over, uh, you know, all the beaded mica. See, I'm good with that. Because what you see is what you get, right? If you see little drops of mica, it's going to dry with drops of mica, okay? Someone asks, is the core of the paper black? Yes. It is a black cord cardstock. Hmm, see, I'm liking that. I'm liking what has happened. Again, what you see is what you get. So if you like those drips, we'll dry them you'll get those drips. Yeah, we'll even tear a little piece of it. Why not? I'll just finish drying this, right? There you go. Nice. All right, I'm gonna keep going through this decade. I'm just gonna pick up whatever else I can on this. I'm gonna add a little bit more water. I just wanna get a little bit more, more movement out of that. But I don't, I mean, you could rub over this with your finger, but for that matter, then you could have done a, a crayon and maybe I'll highlight with a little crayon just to show you how you can use that. All right, beautiful. Uh, Tim mentioned Vicky on Instagram. Can anyone tell me which? Uh, Vicky is Dig That Crazy Chick. She is one of the makers. So if you go to the maker page, there'll be a link uh, right, right there. I'm sure Mario will probably throw one up into the chat, which is good. Could you add crit paste and make grungy growth? Of course, yes. Good, good, yes. No, Vicky, yeah, Vicky Booten is not the one that did the wood candy corn. No, Mario threw the link up there. But Vicky Booten is fabulous. Let's just be clear on that. She is. I adore her. Okay, now look at how this paper is shaping up. I'm glad I went back and added water that second time, and I'll show you why. Um, I think what's really unique about this is look at how that mica kind of spread out a little bit more. It's still intense in those drip areas, but overall, like... And it's done, it's dry, it's just so, well, that's not dry right there, but it's just beautiful on there. I love that, I'm not gonna touch that one. Let's do another one. Yeah, if you like what you like, just set it off to the side. You can come back to something um, a little bit later. Let's go into the crayons because, you know, to me, the, the most underrated. I wanna take a different color though. I don't wanna use purple. I don't wanna use purple on this. Where is it? There we are. You're going to use a little bit of burning ember okay so for this i'm just going to take the crayon go over the top and smudge it out okay so go over the top and smudge it out that's going to give you just kind of a nice little little burnish look the thing to remember though when you're using crayon is that it's going to be completely uh, opaque right because it's just going to be that pigment so by smudging it it is going to start filling in but we're not going to lose the texture 
right? It's, the texture is still going to be there, but you're not going to, you're going to lose the contrast between that two-tone wood grain. So, you know, in doing this, I don't know, I'm going to, I'm going to try something first and then I'll give you my ultimate opinion. If I would do this again on this paper, if this works, then I would like this for this. If not, I would just say, if you're going to do that, then just do it on a, a piece of inked paper. But I'm just going to take a, a damp paper towel and let's just see. Oh, sweet mother of Micah. That's beautiful. Okay, it worked. Let's take a look at that. Putting that over the top and then wiping, wiping that off with a damp cloth to get rid of the stuff that's on the top. And now we've just left the mica inside that wood grain. Woohoo! Yeah, okay. So that would be a reason. Because I was going to say, if that didn't work, then I would have just, you know, taken regular white wood grain, you know, inked it black, and then just did the crayon. Because why would you need two-tone if, you know... But the fact that now I can go over this and my color is going to stay. See, now I'm, I'm going for it because now, now that I know it works, I can be a little bit more aggressive with it. But yeah, that's beautiful because we're getting that subtlety of the mica, but we're still getting that darkness of, of the wood grain. I'm going to just see how much I can scrub it a bit. Nice. Yep, I like that. Very cool effect by adding the crayons in there and then wiping it away. Really cool. Yep, just see, just a different just a different vibe from that because this is going to just give you that really intense from the mica stain this is what's just going to give us that little bit of shimmer shine from from working with the crayons now i can't help it i just have to try all the colors because that's how i am choose a different blending tool right because you know if you blend with the same one you just did oh look at that see and and i wasn't going to do purple you even heard me say i'm putting that away and then out it comes there we are. Okay, where are we looking for? We're we looking for a Wicked Elixir. Oh, yeah. Very cool. I'm running out. I'm running out of blending tools here. Let's clean these off. Crayons are completely water reactive. So unlike inks, they never stain. So see, they come right off of your fingers just with water. But we're going to use that and, and lift that away. Mm -mm. Okay, see, that's magic right there. That's really, really cool. That's going to be really great with the Christmas one too, see? Because you're maintaining the, the integrity of the color of that wood grain, and you're able just to, because you can keep taking it off, right? That's pretty amazing. Come on, sweet mother of Micah. <laughs> what? Yeah, I, that's what I think. It's pretty cool. I mean, because the regular crayons aren't going to do that. They're not going to give you that that shine in there. Anyway, you, you get the idea. Very, I mean, just some really great things that you can do. After all, it's just wood grain, but the two-tone, I mean, the fact that you can just do that, I mean, come on, it's like a tiki right there. It's, I love this stuff. And yes, I've already, yeah, I've already ordered more than I probably should, <laughs> but it doesn't mean I'm not going to order more after this demo, because now that I just did that, I'm like, okay, I'm going to need a little bit more, because I need enough to get me till next Halloween, because I'll use it every day. It's just going to be a good, yeah, a good background, right? Patty, can you okay. need more paper? <laughs> yeah, she'll be, she'll be Patty, getting that email. Need some more paper. Okay, so now we're going to talk, we're going to do a couple of spray things, and I'm going to talk about stamps, and then, if, you know, if you still have questions, you guys can just let me know. So I do love the moon masks. If you remember the moon masks from last year, these are from Stampers Anonymous. Uh, they're, they're still available. They're available uh, year-round, but it was a great way to create kind of a moon background. Right? And it was really fun to use spray stain, or you can also use uh, mica, but I thought when, when I have the sprays, I might as well just at least create one moon, right? Maybe it's going to be kind of green or whatever. It's going to be good. Yeah, should be like, we'll have it in the bulk. Okay. So um, when I use, so the moon masks, they, they come in a size. They don't, they don't have all four. One of, I think this size was in the stamp timber uh, set last year. So I think these are the three sizes that come in the pack. I'm glad I remembered that. This is, that was a special one. Um, but they're really cool because they have a solid shape that is going to create the foundational piece. So you can use these anytime you want to just create a mask. They're made out of the same stencil material. And then they have the stencil of that circle if you want to add in the detail of the moon, right? Or a planet. I saw people do all sorts of cool different planets as well. Uh, a couple of tips. You can do many things. Some people like to use pixie spray and add glue and stuff to the back of uh, their stencils. And you, you could certainly do that if you want. One thing that I like to use is I just take my sticky grid sheets that I have with Sizzix and 
I have a lot of different sticky circles. I just use a paper punch and I punch through this. So maybe you ha I have different size circles throughout the studio because a lot of times it just, it's a great way to stick something down uh, without using say masking tape or, you know, or using the spray. So, and once you have it on there, you could even leave it on there. I just take mine off for, I've taken them off for the season. This is my first moon of the season. Okay, so that means I got to peel off the back. So I am using a, a craft pick off camera just so, because my eyes, even with glasses, I need to be able to get off the back of this. All right, without stabbing this into my finger. So I'm going to peel off the release paper. That's going to be sticky, right? Place that on the stencil material and then just take my craft pick and go under that other side of the release paper and peel that off. So if you're going to reuse this, put it back in the, in the thing, you could save these, but really I don't. I don't plan to do that. All right. So now uh, maybe we want to just do, maybe we want to just do part of it. Okay. Maybe we want to just do part of that on a, on a tag. Okay. So now when I stick that down, it's just not going to go anywhere. I can still use this with an ink blending tool or whatever I want, I want to use. Okay. So I'm going to take, okay. I'm going to do a bunch of different things for this first background. Okay. So we'll take a little bit of mica see mine are getting a little drippity i don't care a little iron gate and also take some decayed that's going to give it just a, a nice a nice little bit of kind of a golden glow not much of that to start then i'm going to take this is just going to be a little bit of ice spruce it's just going to be some color on there then i'm going to take some black soot now black soot is going to be probably the most intense so i just want to be be aware of that and then I'm going to take a little bit of shaded lilac. Okay, this is an oxide spray. So there we go. And we're just going to add, I'm just going to add some splatter. So my distance is a little bit further away. I could have done a splat box for this, but I didn't. I do love this, um, this color, especially for Halloween of oxide, because see that little purple? It's almost, it's almost electric. You wouldn't think it's like a neon, but in an oxide, it almost looks like, you know, the whole black light thing. All right. So what you need to remember at this point is as much as you want to get that heat tool out, because you're like, Ooh, I'm going to do that denied. Okay. Cause if you, if you do that, you'll be adding another moon mask to your cart because you will cook this. So what we need to do is just carefully do the dismount. Okay. And that's what I love about working with uh, the sticky grid because it has a very easy release and it gave me something and I could print this, right? You could do like a monoprint on another card or a journal page or something like that with it if you wanted to, but now I just flip it over so I can clean it off, right? I'm just gonna set this off to the side. I've got some stain dripped all over me. That's all right. Now I can go in and cook, okay? I'm just gonna dry to start. I don't, I don't need this to be crispy dry again. I just wanna kind of create that outline. And if you wanna keep that solid outline, keep it. Okay, but if you want to create kind of a, a little bit of a, a wicking, we're going to add water. Now, this technique was inspired by uh, Stacy, another maker, where she was doing this. And, and that, you know, th that technique was inspired by Stacy. The whole idea of the moon mask was inspired by Emma when she was cutting out circles. And I'm like, gosh, wouldn't it be cool if we just had a stencil of a bunch of circles? But then, you know, if they're just circles, then to me, they could always be suns, which they could. But I love the idea of just adding that other stencil layer. So, yeah, inspiration is everywhere. So now I'm just going in with water and look at what's happening. Whoo, that magic. So imagine doing an eyeball. Forget the moon. Do a creepy bloodshot eyeball, right? Kind of looking out of a card. Wouldn't that be fun? Very cool. So this could be anything you want, but now I need to dry it because the race is on, right? Distress does what when it's water reactive? What does it do, Mario? It wicks. Well done. It wicks. That is the magic. It's not just moving it's wicking it's it's actually going somewhere and that is the effect that we love about distress so cool right really really fun to to just play around and i think once you understand the properties of what you have man your playtime just became so much better so take a look at that how simple that is but see by adding all of those little things that maybe at first you're like well i don't why do you need to have one little spray of decayed well because look at that when it's drying that little bit of gold. Why do you need that little bit of uh, shaded lilac oxide? Because that little bit of purple is dreamy. Why do you need to add a little ice spruce? Why not just black? Well, because that ice spruce is giving me not just black, but it's giving me kind of that bluish 
undertone. Why do you want the iron gate? Well, because that's what's giving that night sky that whole silvery glow. So that's why. Do you have to do it this way? My gosh, no. But I think sometimes we get really, I don't know, I don't want to say lazy, but I'm going to because I, I'm guilty of it as well. But as makers, we get lazy. We don't want to, we forget all the stuff in the toy box because we have this new thing and we're just going to use that one color and that's what we have. But well, then why do we have, you know, 60 colors of something if not to use them and just because you use them it doesn't mean the entire make needs to be purple or the entire make needs to be decayed or whatever remember all of those things and i'm i am guilty of it not very often though i have to say i'm i think i'm on the other side of it where i bring out 20 colors just because just in case i might want to use it right so now i'm just going now that it's dry i'm going to take my water and now i'm going to add those drips right kind of bigger drips and then quickly go in with a paper towel, place that down and lift this off. I don't necessarily want to outline them on this background because I don't want to detract from the moon. So that's why I didn't dry them, but I certainly wanted to lift some areas through that black. So it wasn't so misty, right? You could, cause you can kind of tell initially when it was solid, but see that little bit of water, see how it just broke up that color, a great background. Now you could add, a die cut, it could be Happy Halloween, it could be little bats that fly out, it could be many things. And now if we wanted to add some of that moon in, we can, and we will, and we shall. So here we go. We're gonna take this, we're gonna make sure that it's dry, because we want this to be dry, okay? We'll get rid of this. So a little bit of water. I'll take that paper towel, kind of like a squeegee. What I love about working on a glass media mat, a glass cleans off like a dream. All right, and I'm just, again, I'm not pushing any ink into that mat, I'm just taking it away from it. And then we will find the coordinating stencil piece, right? And you can put it however you want. You can use either side. Uh, you probably are gonna wanna tape it down or stick this down. I'm not going to just because of the demo, I'm gonna throw caution to the wind and, and see what we get. But let's take something like, well, did I bring anything? I didn't. Mm. I thought I had a pumice stone ink pad somewhere. Can you, oh, I do. See, I have it in my moon demo bucket and I'm taking from another demo bucket. That is bad form, Holtz. Okay, jeez. Organized yeah, over there. that's right. Yeah, if you saw this, oh my gosh, there's so much stuff. I'm taking pumice stone, I just like it. It could be any color you want and it could be an oxide if you don't want to do an ink. I also don't know why I just did that. Oh my gosh, get it together. This is, this is when the late night ideas. Okay. Could I have, candy? could I have used this? Uh, yes, but no, you could use a blending tool. I don't like to use a blending tool on stencils that have detail, right? Because it's not going to go to the edge of the detail. It's going to show this, but it's not going to show it as crisp. So I want to use some type of ink brush. I'm just going to use a blending brush for that. So if you have another kind of ink brush that you like, go for it. I love these just because of the, the type of bristle and the control that I can get. So I'm just going to take the one that I have designated for brown or mucky colors. Okay. I'm going to just see what I have. Oh, that's the perfect, perfect color, perfect color of, of sludge right there. All right. I'm going to just see how much of this I want to, to kind of be visible. I think that's going to work. Okay. And I'll hold this. It's going to be fine for me. And I'm just going to just stipple that down with the brush by having the brush completely retracted like that, my bristles can fan out. And I like that because it's not going to give me that concentration of color. If I wanted that, I could slide this forward, right? That metal, and that's going to make these compact. But often when you do that, you get this really dark spot of ink that you have trouble blending out. So that's why I just prefer just kind of this brush. And I just do that pouncing motion just to kind of go in, add that color and lift it off and look at that. Just that cool little detail that we have. Now, even though I've added this and I want it to be like that, I still want it to look like the rest of the background, right? My, the rest of my background is kind of kind of splotchy a little bit. So I'm gonna do the same idea with water. Just a few drips, I'm not gonna hose it, but I'll just dab it with a little bit of uh, water and a paper towel. And do you see what that did? It just kind of broke through that ink a little bit. So it looks more like the background, right? Magic, very, very cool cool thing, cool way to use the moon on a, on a Halloween sky. You could do all sorts of different colors, right? We wanted to add some stars. Well, we have the technology. Let's do that. All right. Let's take a little harvest moon 
and let's add some of those. We know that if we're going to keep our distance, it is a good idea to have a splat box unless you don't mind having color everywhere. Notice every time I've picked up one of these, even though they're laying down, you still need to shake it and just look at the bottom. See, I've got, there's a little bit of that sludge right there. I don't want that to be there, but I'm going to keep my distance so I can just add some little sparkly stars, right? Could I use a splatter brush? Sure but splatter brush isn't going to give me as big of the drips as I want. A couple of little sprays is all you need. And we're going in dry. See, it's just so much fun. Oh, look at those. Look at those yellow stars. It's so good. We do. Yeah, so for the blending brushes, this is all I have. And I say all because this is really all you need. I have one dedicated for red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, and my brown. I use them for both ink and oxide, although I use them more for ink. If you're going to use oxide, you do need to wipe them off afterwards, but it's just an easy way to do it. And I just color the, the ring with a Sharpie. You just take a Sharpie and you can, yep, there they are. Oh, other Under way, there. other way. <laughs> there you go. I don't know how <laughs> Thanks. Over here. You did good. Yeah, just a Sharpie. Thanks, Mario. Yeah, you okay. just color around it and that's how I, I label them. It wears off over time and you just color it again. Look at that. See, just that little bit of Harvest Moon adds those little stars in there. Again, another background, but that's just, that's just taking that up a notch. So is it, a, is it great to do purple? Sure, it could be any colors you want. It doesn't have to be dark, but now I could do like a purple die cut or have purple bats coming up and I have contrast. So again, you don't always have to be stuck with a, a certain color palette either. All right, okay. Next up, let's talk about another favorite that I think people uh, maybe are a little uh, unsure of or just maybe you forget that you, you can or maybe you, don't even know you can. So here we go. I'm going to clean this up a little bit <laughs> ish. We'll take a towel, clean that off. Okay. So what we're going to do next is we're going to incorporate a spray in a way uh, that achieves, in my opinion, a very, very cool effect. So I'm going to get my stamps over here. Gosh, I have stuff everywhere. Don't I? You do. I know I'm trying to you like, I'm no, I'm just trying to look, I'm trying to look for like a landing spot, but I'll be all right. Okay. So what I really like about creating backgrounds, and so far we've created just a few backgrounds just during this demo, okay? There's this one and this one, right? Is taking your backgrounds and do things with them. So the first thing is like, well, can you stamp on this stuff? Yes, you can. You can absolutely stamp over a background that you've done uh, with the mica stain or your stains or your oxide. What you need to be aware of though, is that because you're stamping on something shiny, you're going to need to go as intense as possible. So here I just took the, the botanic collage and I matted this on a piece of black cardstock because I think that that draws your eye more to the, the black design. That's another thing to keep in mind that if you stamp something, just a little bit of that cardstock is going to help, help isolate that. But what you could do is I stamped this with archival. You're going to need to stamp with something that's going to sit on the top of that mica. Distressed Archival Black Soot, I like this the best. It's the darkest black uh, for me, but if you have a nice black permanent ink, you could stamp stays on, uh, Versicolor, any, anything that's just gonna be your favorite black ink to stamp. Uh, Distress ink, not really going to show up. If you try to use Black Soot Distress ink, it's not going to want to sit over the top of it. It's gonna wanna go and play with his friends in the background. Distress Archival, it's the same color, but Archival ink is oil-based, and it's gonna wanna sit on the top. This was done using a stamping tool, right? So any kind of stamping tool you have. And this was actually three layers to get it to be even this dark. But I like that because I still wanted it to be part of my background. If you want something to be super intense sitting on the top of everything, my advice would be to stamp in clear and emboss with black embossing powder. That would give you that vivid, crisp black. But then I think you lose the nuance of your background, right? I think if your image is just screaming, sitting on the top, you're not really going to be able to turn it to see, you know, almost like that image is underneath the layers of that mica stain. Again, you have options, creative options, but if you're trying to get a nice image, remember you want to choose something permanent that's going to sit on the top of that mica and you may need to do a couple of impressions, right? Which would be really, really beautiful for that. Okay. Another thing that I love is just the idea of taking the stains themselves and stamping with them, right? That's what I think people forget about is that stamping with stain is beautiful. It is your ink and your pearl in one shot, okay? That's all it is. This is just stamped in stain. This is Harvest Moon and Burning Ember. 
that's it. This is what you can do to the background, right? So you can stamp and then you can go in and blend. You could then splatter on some iron gate. You can do a little paper distressor, right? Remember those? We're going old school people. We're, we're taking out all the, all the toys from, what did I say in that post? From yesteryear, right? <laughs> Just going back and, and taking things. But I love stamping with stains, so I wanted to show how you can do that. It's really easy, but, but choosing the stamps for this, right? This is not, you know, a foolproof, a foolproof technique. You really have to choose your stamps wisely for this, okay? So let me show you what I used, okay? For, for me, and I'll take out all my, all my stuff over here, my toys, there's my paper distressor, stamping block, ink for blending, blending tool to ink the edges, okay? And this is the stamp set that I used. Um, you can try a lot of different stamp sets, that's fine. This is an older one, this is Leaf Prints, it's CMS 273, um, but you can tell that the image itself is already very splotchy. It is a non-detailed image. If you are going for detail, working with this technique is not going to be your friend because the fluid ink is going to fill in all the blanks. Okay, so if you tried to stamp this, your butterfly would just, it would be a blob. This text would be a blob. Sometimes you can get away with handwriting if it's a little bit bigger or bolder, but my advice to you, if you're going to try stamping with stain, any kind of stain, it could be mica stain, it could be spray stain, it could even be oxide spray, is choose stamps that are bold, somewhat identifiable, but also have some open space. Because if they're just silhouette stamps, that's also a hot mess because now you're dealing with surface tension that when you press that solid image down and you lift up, the inks want to like stick together and then they ooze out the side. So this to me is kind of perfect. And there's many like that. Any kind of watercolor-ish stamp like a wildflower or something would be great. For this, I also personally like to choose a longer block than a shorter block. Why? Uh, because I want to get out of the way, really. So I'll, I'll take that same stamp. All these, like this fern, I think I'll probably do the fern as well. Um, and when I say out of the way, it means by putting it on this block, right? Because you're going to see I'm going to go into something wet. It's going to allow me to see where I want to go, press, and lift out of the way. If I have a small block and my hand's in the way, I'm going to be like doing this and pressing too hard and your ink is going to go everywhere. Okay, so just another tip, if you have a longer block, this is just one of the grid blocks. If you have that set, this is one of those in there. Um, but just, it, I find it, it helps. Now, if you have a stamping tool, that might be all you need. So you're good to go. We're gonna work on craft because it's fun. Just makes for an easy background, but you could do this over an inked background already. Maybe you did some cool uh, backgrounds and now you wanna stamp on them. But if, if you're doing this, I wouldn't recommend stamping this over uh, an inked background that you already did with mica stain because I think you're going to lose the, the effect. So I'm going to shake this up. We're going to do kind of the, the same idea so you can see how this one's done over here. So this is going to be a little harvest moon. We'll just spray some down on the sheet. We'll take a little bit of burning ember. All right. Shake that up. And we're going to spray some down here. So that's all I need. Those two colors don't need to, to mix it up or do anything like that. I'm going to take the stamp and I'm going to treat this like an ink pad. And you can see that it's wet, right? If you, if you tap this down, you're going to have your own little pool party. Okay. And I can go in different areas of that. And this is what's happening. It's picking up that ink, but I'm lightly tapping. That's the other thing that's important. If you press down, it's just like the brayer. Remember, if you press down, your stain's not going to go onto the stamp. It's going to stay onto the sheet. So now I'm just going to see where I want to put it. I'm going to press down with just some light pressure and I'm going to lift off. We're going to let it do its thing. You get what you get and you don't throw a fit and no CPR stamping, right? I don't need to sit there and press, press, press because that's going to push that liquid beyond the boundaries of the stamp. Same thing when I'm picking this up. I have to be really light handed with this because if I push, right, my ink wants to just stay there and it goes to the outer edge. Maybe you want that look, right? But for me, I'd rather just kind of play around in the puddles, see what I get, stamp, still need to have some pressure, but then dismount release and you'll see that your pearl just kind of takes a life of its own and there's another one we can try a, a second generation maybe we'll go into watercolor paper this time and maybe we will try like i see that i need a little bit more harvest moon okay i think that's going to be really good excellent there we go and i like working with a rubber stamp for this because um, i'm going to try to just push this one down so i can get that that pearl on the outer edge okay there we go Let's try that. Mm, that's good. Oop, let's go on the smoothie side. 
Stamp that one. Hmm, not bad. See, not a fan because to me it kind of filled in the blanks because I've already pressed that ink in where it shouldn't, but it's still not gonna be not gonna be so bad that I can't use it. And we'll use the rest of this here. All right, look at all those. We could just keep going and going. Clean up, a little bit of water, right? Could you then still stamp with this? Yeah, we can. It's probably gonna be pretty wet and splotchy, but let's see. You don't know, but I'll show you these when you dry. The thing about stamping, watercolor stamping, if you've ever, even if you've done this with ink pads, it's very hard to like embrace imperfection on this because when you stamp it, it looks like a hot mess. And oftentimes when it dries, it's not really that bad. It's actually pretty beautiful. Just wipe that off while it's wet. That's done. I'll get rid of this stuff, right? Just kind of clean that off. I've got coin dozer going on over here. It's got so much stuff. A little water, a little towel. And I'm gonna set this one over. So you can see already, you lost the detail, but it's not gonna be bad, it really isn't. It's not gonna be worth trashing. It's just something that if you, if you know better, do better. Don't, don't keep doing that if you know that's the cause of it. All right, let's take this pearl and this fern. I'm gonna place that just so it fits on the block. Again, right on the end. I've got my craft paper ready. This time we're gonna go in with a little bit of a Wicked Elixir and we'll, we'll do some decayed as well. I think that's gonna be a nice little blend. That's good. In fact, I have, I have some peeled paint spray stain, so why not? Let's add a little bit of that instead. All right, that's gonna give me just a little, a little hint of green and then we'll take some decayed and put some there. Okay, here we are. Now we're gonna take this and just, again, just do the dance. Why? Because I, I wanna pick up just a little bit of everything everywhere. All right, let's take that, stamp it down, just a little light pressure, lift it, wow, so good, so, so good. Set that one over there, we'll do another one. Again, tap, tap, tap. So this is where you can start to look at your stash of stamps, right, and say, oh, you know what, I haven't really used those. Uh, foam stamps are good for that as well because they're, they're pretty bold, but also very solid. So I just love the look of, of these pieces. Let me just clean this off. Okay, a little bit of water to clean that off. And we're gonna dry these so we can kind of finish one of those up and you can see what it looks like, all right? So these guys, as it dries, you can see that's where the magic is really taking place. You've got the coloring of the stain. You also have the whole idea of working uh, with a stain and that little bit of shimmer on there, which is nice. Okay, I'm gonna dry one of these guys too. Beautiful, and one of these, <laughs> beautiful. Do you have to use a heat tool? No, uh, you can let it air dry, but when you use a heat tool, it almost kind of comes into focus, right? Because that's where your, your outlines are really defined, even the fern. And we've got that tag as well. So mixed media, watercolor, craft, they all work. They all do something different. Okay, so this one, look at that, look at that fern. So pretty, right? Because you see it, you see the color, and then you just get to see that, that shine of mica. Same thing here. I just like that. Does it have to be mica stain? No, but to me that mica stain adds that little bit of, you know, almost like if you're doing foiling or anything, that little bit of, of surprise, that bling, if you will. So to finish it off, really, really simple. You can take an ink pad, take a blending tool, right? We can place that down. Now when I blend, I always blend on the glass. Blending on glass to me is so much smoother than blending on uh, any type of, of nonstick sheet because the nonstick sheet is fabric and so it has a weave to it. And I just start with a lot of like the fresh ink. I'll just kind of do a little hop, skip, jump around, and then I'll go back with whatever's left on there and really start blending and softening that out. So some people when they're blending, you know, they'll start here and they'll just keep going and then they'll go and then they'll go. And then you're spending the whole time trying to balance. But if you just kind of hop it around, then you can go back and see how we can just soften that right into uh, that leaf, okay? Nice, and that was on craft. Then when you're good with that, we're gonna take some water, same thing. Let me just get a little spray going. Uh, oh, that, was, that felt good, actually. I sprayed that into the fan, it was nice. Okay, I'm just gonna do a, little, a few little drips, maybe some a little bit bigger in areas, because I like that, okay? I want to outline it, 
So we, we have the trick to that. Quick little shot with a heat tool. And then we're gonna pick that up. Now I'm not going to pick it up on the leaf because I want the leaf to dry with that color on it. So for that, I'm just gonna finish drying it where the leaf is. Because if I dab that, that's gonna pick up some of the color and I really liked the intensity of that color. So I'm just gonna dry that water spot and it'll stay there. It's gonna give it a, a cool little look, but it's just going to just stay there, see? If I would have dabbed it, it would have been light like the rest of this, which wouldn't be the worst, but it's not what I wanted. Then we'll take a paper distressor, right? I love this thing. It's probably one of, this is the, one of the first things I designed with Tonic um, when they did the scissor, because this was, this was for thread and they were really into the whole sewing thing. I'm like, hey, can you make that, you know, out of plastic and it doesn't need a fancy lanyard and it doesn't need to be, just make it. It has a blade all the way around it never dulls you use it indefinitely once you have it and all the notches do the same thing but it allows you just to kind of go in and chew up that paper see look at that yeah this is kind of old school you used to do it with a open blade of scissor right nice and you can kind of ding the edges you could go and ink that if you want but see it just gives it a nice tattered look you can also take it along the edge of your uh, media mat just kind of Get those extra little dents just rolling that so you can get those indentations but not bad right beautiful simple card front if you want and then if you wanted to to add a little bit of accent which is what i i wanted to do on mine i'm going to take a little iron gate all right because that's going to give me that gray black and then spray some of that down i'm going to take my splatter box oh my word this is just insane then I'll take my splatter tool, get my little splatter brush there, and we're gonna just splatter some of that uh, onto this background. In fact, I think I wanna go even a little bolder. What did I do with it? Here we go. We're gonna take some black soot stain too. Just respect that, because that one's, that one's gonna go on pretty intense, but I'm gonna like that. Yeah, I do. Okay, so all I'm doing, just always grabbing this and just you know, I would say like playing the harp. You're just kind of plucking these back and just letting those do it. You're not, you're not shooting a bow and arrow. You're not like trying to do that. You're just letting it just dance, but you're not getting it on your fingers. You're really staying, not that it matters, but the idea is that you're just letting all those little dots just continue to, to flick and splatter off. So you get all those little sizes of speckles, not just a big, you get a splatter, right? So just a little bit. I think some people with the splatter brush, you know, they want to like just do one little shot and they, you know, they want it to go on perfect. But if you just keep working with it, the little tiny bits that come off of that brush, that's magic. It really is. And then we're gonna dry it because that's gonna bring up the, the mica. But see those, those splatters, as I mentioned before, they're not overpowering now. See, look at that. When the light hits those, because we use that little iron gate, they're just like little, little gunmetal sparkles. But you can see it a little bit more Without the light, why? Because I added a little touch of black soot, so that, that made them more visible here. So you can see where the black soot came in versus just the, the stain. But quite fun, right? I mean, seriously, so many things that we can do um, working with stamps, working with stencils, working with embossing folders and textured, working with brayers, working with texture paste, working oxide, crayons, working with... Uh, translucent paste. I mean, there's so many different backgrounds and ideas just from understanding the magic of of mica stain and the crayon.